Oh, and a problem. Oh! My gosh! Huge impact between the 99 and the 62. There's lots of debris blowing up. The medical workers right there, absolutely instantly. That was a tremendous impact, just scary to look at. He popped out right into the sunlight. There was no way he could have seen Melicelli. Caution has now turned into a red flag at Daytona International Speedway. That's a red flag. Well, that was the heart-stopping moment in this year's Rolex 24 at Daytona when Mabel Gidley, driving the number 99 Red, uh, Red Dragon for Gaines Co. Racing, got heavily into the back of the near stationary Ferrari driven by Matteo Maliuccelli. Maliuccelli was observed briefly and then released with relatively minor injuries, but that was not the case, sadly, for our friend Mamo Gidley, who suffered some very serious injuries. Happy to say, though, that he is out of the hospital. He is with us now from a rehab facility in San Francisco. Mamo, can you hear me? I can, yeah, nice to talk to you, Bob. Well, it's great to hear your voice. Uh, Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader are with me. Tell all the fans out there how you're feeling right now. Uh, well, it's a, it's a really slow process, you know. I mean, uh, there's times when when it's a little frustrating because I just want things to happen quicker. But every day things get better. And honestly, um, you know, with the people I've been around, and especially these rehab centers, I feel basically uh, lucky um, with the ability to heal. You know, some people aren't in this situation. So I'm feeling pretty good. I just, I just need more time. Maymo, um, when we look at the replay of that incident, it, it literally stops your heart and takes your breath away. I can't imagine what it can be like for you, mate, to, to watch that. So good to hear your voice. But when you look at the incident, can you put into some sort of perspective for us now as to what may have happened? Well, it was just, uh, you know, it was just a combination of trying to get around a, a slower car and then not realizing that there was a, another car going like 15 miles an hour on a place where I was doing 110 or something like that. So it was just, uh, you know, it was unavoidable. Um, you know, from a blame standpoint, there's really probably nothing anybody could have done. Uh, I was just pulling out to pass somebody and then just didn't realize there was a car stopped on the track. So, uh, you know, a lot happened. I mean, I suffered a lot of broken bones uh, in the car and I can only imagine what all the uh, rescue guys and people did to get me out, but they all did a great job. But yeah, it was pretty, pretty big hit. I know, Memo, by nature that you want to get up and get running right away. I know that your, your team uh, that's taking care of you probably have a plan uh, of what to do next, and I know the frustration you feel having been through that myself, uh, not being able to just get up and go, man, and, and I feel for you. I'm so glad to hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the team's been unbelievable. I mean, Bob Stallings is, is uh, you know, he's a role model for everybody, and it's always been. He's just a great friend, and just the whole team's been fabulous, and uh, I do want to get back out there. I mean, I'm just driven so hard, and uh, you know, I've, I've just suffered a lot. I've had a lot of hard uh, things coming up through the ranks, but this is uh, by far uh, the hardest thing I've ever dealt with. But it also drives me to, to get back, you know. I mean, I feel good. I know I can heal. And uh, the team's uh, been great. And, you know, I just can't wait to get back out there. It's just going to take, take a little bit of time. But I'm going fast, so... Well, I know it's been very difficult for your team as well. Bob Stallings has made the decision not to compete anymore this year. We'll await further developments on that front. In the meantime, have you been given any kind of timeline from your doctors about how long it might take for you to start building back up to getting in the race car again? Well, I've got to tell you, the doctors, you know, at Halifax Hospital, which was the one out where, uh, out in Florida, um, and, um, you know, they did a great job. And so everybody that's ever seen any of the, the uh, um, x-rays, and I just had some done recently, they're just amazed. And this x-ray just had done a couple days ago, they actually released me to, to basically put as much weight on everything as possible to basically start rehabbing. So uh, that was like, <laughs> that was really surprising because it's only been just six weeks barely. And uh, so, um, you know, everything's, everything's looking really good. I mean, it's actually progressing faster than, than everybody's thought. So, uh, but I'm still just taking it kind of easy and I just want to just get back there and get as strong as possible and not make any mistakes. And, uh, you know, get back out there. May Mill, race car drivers are obviously driven by results. And uh, do you now set yourself any mini goals, just which are even conservative, or do you just let it take its take its course? Well, my, my big goal, I mean, there's been so many goals over the last uh, 
few weeks, you know, for me in the rehab center. One was to get out of the bed, um, and, uh, you know, the next was to get out of the bed with my own, you know, on my own. So now I'm to the point where I can go from I can sit up, I can get out of the bed, I can get in the wheelchair, I can get onto the bathroom by myself, I can do sort of stuff by myself. My, my next goal is to get, to get rid of the wheelchair, and so I'm starting to put weight on everything and starting to try to sort of stand, um, and, uh, but I, getting on crutches or something where I can move around, that's definitely my, my next immediate goal. Well, Mamo, I can't tell you how good it feels to hear your voice and how good you sound. I know your teammate Darren Law has been thinking about you. I'm sure he's been listening in. So on behalf of him and all of us here at Fox Sports, thanks for taking the time for, to talk to us and uh, Godspeed and getting yourself back up and back out here. Yeah, well, listen, guys, I want to say thank you and also to Jim France and the series. Those guys that got me out of the car and, and worked on me were fabulous and also all the fans. There's been thousands of people that have uh, given me support. And uh, like I said, this is harder than any experience I've been through because of so many accidents, so many um, broken bones at once. And having the thousands of people with cards or on the internet, it's, it's just been great. So I just want to say uh, I really appreciate it. And even though I haven't personally been able to thank a lot of people because I've just been recuperating, I just want to say it'll, it'll, I just appreciate it so much. And thank you very much for everything. Pleasure's all ours. Take care, buddy. Best Thanks, of luck, guys. Mate. Well, mate. Thank you, guys. He's a class act, that man. Amazing how good he sounds. I don't know what I expected, but you know, the resilience wow. is uh, just phenomenal. Amazing. And he's been through nothing this extreme. He had a massive crash at Road America when he was running for Chip Ganassi in yeah. the Champ Car. Yeah, I remember the that. Cars, yeah. and, uh, I was there for that. He's just one of those guys who refuses to give up. That's that's how he got to the point in his career by not giving up. Right. And um, I think that same determination is now going to get him through this. Well, that's terrific. If you'd like to contact Memo, by all means do. Help him keep his spirits up as he continues the process of mending. I'm sure he probably made it sound easier than yeah, it yeah. is. He'll, he'll need the encouragement, you know, because yeah. the worst part of it is, the, is how slow things take. You know, it's... You want to get and, going, but and there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of pain. Rehabilitation right. should just be. Yeah, you know, it's not just not good. Yeah. It's not just waiting. There's a lot no. of pain you go through. They're taking those X-rays for a reason. Pits are now open. Prototypes can stop for service. And everybody but the Mazda tried it. Let's go to Chris Neville. And Sage Gurm coming to pit lane his first time. And I asked Mike Hall about that opening lap when he got around Max Angelelli and Sebastian Bourdais. He said, you know what, we told him to be patient when he was out there. And I said, what would you tell him after that opening lap? He said, well, we reminded him patience would be a good thing. But listening to Sage on the radio, he said the car is a little bit tight, so they were going to make some adjustments. Andrew? Yeah, well, I'm down here with a five, which is just about to go out. Last thing going to happen is the fuel is going to be disconnected. The fuel now. And again, uh, I'm actually shaken to the core by the uh, big Chevy that powers it out of here. Uh, to you, Chris Neville. Well, Andrew, problems on the 01. Mamo Rojas, very slow pit stop. It looked like problems at the right rear trying to get that tire on. So we're going to check in with the team and try and figure out if there was an issue. Yeah, talking to the group, obviously at Daytona, they were so swamped in just getting the car to be able to run and get through the tests and stuff. They really had no time to practice their pit stops and being in the sort of normal form they would be even for the opening round. Here's a replay of the problem. I think the car is in gear. This is the problem. Mamo has got the car in gear. So as the guy's trying to do the right rear wheel change, the hub is spinning, Dorsey, and that makes it impossible. Otherwise, you're going to lose some uh, skin on that one. Yeah, you can't catch up with it. You don't want to stick your hands in there for sure. They were hampered early on in the Rolex 24 by that lack of practice time getting their pit stops done. They said they're in better shape, but still not where they want to be. They right. said we've still been very busy. Yes, it's not the first round, and there's been several weeks since that first round of the championship, but you know, we're, we're still going, developing this car. We're at the test, a lot of work since, and uh, you know that normal time we're just sitting idle and maybe have a couple of three days spare in the middle of the uh, from one race to the next that's just not been available to them well in case you think it's easy you just send a bunch of guys over the wall with air wrenches to change tires it's no. not at all and different rakes this year they're learning too. Right. two wheel guns a different procedure as well so it's not just do what you did last year yep it's do something you've never rehearsed before you right. know it's a procedure you go in there normally you know you put the car in neutral then you put your foot on the brake to keep the stop the rotor from turning and then once the mechanic gets there you take your foot off the brake and there's a car going slowly and one of the Astons, one of the Astons yeah. having a problem looks like he's got it going now anyway then you put you take your foot off the brake so he can center the wheel by turning the wheel so there's there's a lot going on there that 
you need to learn with oh, your he, crew. He's got some he's kind got of clutch issue. Clutch, or, yeah. or an axle. Popping out of gear. Now, it could be an axle, too, if he snapped an axle. The 007 but car. I didn't see it turn one way or the other. If it, let's see if it does it here. It's all Carter. We saw him earlier. Uh, he's got a blown-up clutch, I think. Yeah, as soon as he tries to give any serious... Yeah. See, if it was an axle, just... it would do that, too, but it would turn the car one way or the other. Yeah, it seems to be driving pretty straight, but... Yeah. Yeah, I think it's got a blown up clutch, is what I think. Kevin Buckler and his Racers Group AMR operation have pulled out all the stops this weekend. They have new sponsorship for the residences at the Hard Rock Hotel being built in Daytona Beach, Florida shortly. Had a big hospitality event in the paddock. So they'll be looking for good things before this Mobile 112 Hours of Sebring comes to an end. Looks like the sixth prototype, the muscle milk car, is still in the pits as it opens for GT activity. Yeah, good eyes. There's the number six, Chris Neville. Well, Corvette Racing going to get really busy down here, going to shuffle the deck on both cards, going to do driver changes, fuel and tire. Robin Liddell taking over for Tommy Milner. A little bit slow trying to get the door open on the four. We're going to kind of keep an eye on the three, too, because they had that bodywork issue early on with the contact at the front. And they had to change that bodywork because they were worried about the door. But the door opens quickly. Ryan Briscoe out. Jan Magnuson getting behind the wheel in that car. And the four car just finishing up right side rubber. Andrew. Yeah, well, I'm down here in Porsche. Just saw York Meister. York Bergmeister, I should say, the, uh, the mountain man. He's just got into the 912 and uh, seen a bit of activity in the cockpit of the 911. And a slight problem, but they've sorted that out now. Just slam the door. And I'm going to, it just goes almost over my toes there, the 911. The guys, one thing I noticed at the previous uh, prototype pit stop, I think I saw a very quick pit stop from home racing. I think they made quite a bit of track position, so you might just check that out. All right, they're working on the car, but I wanted to point out that long nozzle, the fuel hose, you see the boom that comes out, and then the fueler is standing there with this nozzle, it has a long yeah. extension on it. I asked the team what that was all about. Several years ago, when Dale Earnhardt Jr. drove with them Sonoma. in Sonoma, California, yeah, he spun incident. in the warm-up, backed it into the wall, the car exploded in flames when the, when the uh, ballistic fuel cell um, suffered a puncture of some sort. The car burst into flames, of course, made all the headlines in the world. But I've been told that they deliberately now bury the fuel tank so deep inside the car that they need that extension, that long, sort of long, elongated nozzle. There you see it on the left of your screen. It like tore the neck out of that, like essentially where this will actually go into the bodywork. That was where the fuel cell basically went to. And what they do now is have another brake further inboard. Right. So if you rip off the fender, you're not immediately getting into the fuel yeah, cell. Yeah, back up down below. Well, that's ironically what caused my car to burn to the ground at Mosport was the very same thing. The fact that it had that that uh, dry brake at the C-pillar mm -hmm. right along the side. Yeah. Well, when that failed, of course, then it just filled the car with fuel. I've so never seen something like that before, but I know that the uh, RLL BMWs here also moved their fuel Buckeyes, if you will, uh, probably for that reason as well, to try to keep it out of harm's way. To Chris Neville. Well, Bob, three cars still stationary down here in pit lane, and what they're doing is they're changing the left rear brake duct. We saw that flat that Ryan Briscoe was dealing with, and as that tire was coming apart, always beats up the body. Also beats up the components in that wheel well, and it just ripped apart that brake duct. So the team taking advantage of this caution, trying to get that car back up to snuff. Yeah, muscle milk guys are in trouble. We saw them on pit lane still. Now they're pushing it behind the wall. Wow. Oh, boy. And they are definitely who you would consider one of the championship contenders this year. So Sebring has uh, taken its toll early here. Jan Martinborough from Great Britain, winner of the Nissan Driver Academy contest, taking a young driving talent from the video gaming stage right up to driving a real fire-breathing race car. Martinborough in the car, along with Klaus Groff and Lucas Lohr, the regulars for Muscle Milk Racing, Greg Pickett's team. The three is now on its way. Let's go to Chris Neville. And Ryan Briscoe looking very fresh. Thought you'd look a little bit more worn out out there. Uh, three car, lots of problems today, but hopefully with this brake duct getting fixed, you guys will be back up to snuff. Yeah, um, you know, we're back on the lead lap, so that was that was key. Uh, car's pretty good. Um, you know, we just got to 
get these little issues out of the way. Um, but we had some consecutive green laps there before. Uh, I was able to put down some pretty good lap times. So the car's handling well. And I think it's only going to get better tonight when it gets cooler because right now the mechanical is a bit average. It's really good in the aero. And I think as it cools off, we get the softer tyre. It's really going to get better in the slow speed. So we just got to we just got to stay there in the game and and it should be good at the end. That left rear, was that because of contact or was that just the debris between the two uh, prototype challenge cars? Yeah, it must have just been a piece of carbon fibre. Um, I thought I missed it all, but then all of a sudden it was flat. So then pit lane was blocked, so I couldn't come in the pits. Even though they were closed, we would have. Um, so we just had to cruise around. It tore up the bodywork a little bit, but I think they just put a bit of bare bond on and it's OK. Yeah, everything's looking good in the three car now, guys. Thanks, Ryan. I spoke to Dan Binks about Ryan Briscoe this weekend. He said, boy, is this kid impressive. He is just on it, just so smooth, just calm on the radio, just fits in, doesn't complain. And he said, that's what I want from a third driver. I, he said, I love the boys that have been through the camp before, but he said, sometimes they come in as the third guy. They want to change the seat, change this, that, and the other. Ryan just slides in, said, yes, yeah, good to go. And he puts down the lap time as well. It was really cool also to see that he could differentiate between the mechanical drip of the car and the arrow. He said, my arrow is good. My mechanical drip is just average he's right when the when the sun goes down and cools off it's going to pick up on the mechanical mm -hmm. grip he's going to dial it right in and that's what you want from a driver nowadays that understands both that looks like fun that'll get you home in a hurry somebody stole my rc plane <laughs> i got yeah. something that looks like that that is a pretty neat Very little cool. deal yeah if anybody knows what that is any of you aero nuts out there let oh, us know i'm sure they do <laughs> i'm sure they do put it on twitter All I know about that is it burns a lot of fuel real quick. But you make it up in time. Folks, planes, and... <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's expensive. Actually, if you're into aviation, Sebring Regional Airport is an interesting destination. There's a lot of military activity that goes on Still, in the immediate area, yeah. including some involving live ordnance. So you have to be very careful. Now, there's another... Yeah, there's gyrocopter there. Yeah, another aeronautical when, oddity. When, when we taught out here for Skip Barber, you know, during the days, every day, uh, you could see all kinds of things going on flying around in this place. We're about to go green. That's right. After another long yellow here, coming up on seven hours, 16 minutes remaining. Surprised that's not Bruce McGinnis, actually. <laughs> he had one of those here for quite a while. He's down there in one of the Skip Barber hospitality areas. Still in the first half of the 60-second running of the Mobile 1 12 hours of Sebring. Lights are out on the Corvette Stingray safety car. We are about to go green. A four day has been very impressive in testing and obviously putting the car on the pole. Spoke to Ian White, he said he just knows the track so well from his days with Peugeot and certainly the IndyCar testing. He really knows his way around this place. Safety car will come off. The order of prototypes, 1 through 10. Bourdais, Karam, Dial, Fogarty, Wilson, green Rojas, green Rockefeller, Yakaman, Pagano, and Taylor. Five and six wide, including the 01. Way over there, Memo wow, Rojas. That among... was tight. That was really wow. tight. Memo nearly got squeezed by that ESM Patron car. And a very dirty line over there as well. This lock up. Oh, Whoa, we got now what? That's GT. That's all GTD cars. Yep. The all together. 46. We've got a Porsche, an Audi, and a Ferrari. That's a pit in wing. again. That's right at pit in. Yes, exit 17. Yeah, it? that's turn 17 right under the uh, under the Mobile One Bridge. They, they got into it before they even got to the corner. Really? Of course, when it's green, you go. So yeah. you don't have to get to the front straight away anymore. You do on the initial start, but green is go. Obviously, if one of them got loose, tangled everybody up. I mean, so you can be overtaking going into yes, the yes. break zone for 17 if you're further back in the pack. This car, the 81, neutral. is stuck in gear. That's a paddle shifter problem that you always have when you can't get the car to rock or move back and forth. I'll play at it behind the wheel. Charlie Putman in that 46 Audi R8. He had a brutal first car out of the Rolex 24 in a massive accident. Yeah, it was a bit of a weird crash, too. We couldn't really determine. I mean, Audi were pretty adamant that there was no sort of failure with the car, but um, Just very turn. strange in the brake zone there for turn one at Daytona, and a uh, massive shunt destroyed the car. 
Those are the worst kind, too, because you got a long way before you hit to know that you're about to hit something mm -hmm. real hard. It slid forever down into the wall. Now here, that one car is still sitting out here, so this should be yeah, a local this, this yellow. This is local yellow, so yep. everyone needs to be careful here. No overtaking, right. sir, otherwise there'll there be a penalty. Yeah. And Sage, Sage is, Karen's getting alongside. Well, you've got to wait for the next corner station before you can go. And the Mazda is providing a block. Well, look <laughs> at this. Block. Right. Number one car, Ryan Dial, looks like he's looking for a way by. Yeah, I think it has it, too. He'll take Karam for second. And again, we've got two different configurations of race car in the prototype class. You've got the Daytona prototypes and the P2 machines, which is that green and black Patron-sponsored ESM HPD right there. Sage won't be happy about that. He got snookered on that restart. I mean, it wasn't his fault, but here's what happened down on that GTDs. Out wide. Oh, a lot of right front wheels off the ground. A Ferrari spins. All three of them together. Yeah, they like, they like the Audi went to the inside, then maybe had to use a bit more brake, and then loses the rear end, I think. Yeah, and gets I think into the contact. Ferrari. Yeah, yeah, there was contact. And then takes out the Porsche, yeah. too. 89 was just an innocent bystander. Yeah, there's not much anybody could have done about that. Or the 45 Audi from Flying Lizards. That's the best view of all of them. Oh, Oops. trouble for the 25 has gone off. Wow, Done damage always... to the right front. Eric Lux. Yeah, and this car's been right at the front of the pack here. Oh, oh. a lot of damage. That's yeah, superficial, though. It's all body work. Tire's still up. This yeah. team finished second at Daytona. They finished second on debut at Petit Le Mans last year. No, so no, it's not. Look at the right oh, front. Oh, no, it's broken. Yeah, broken suspension. Wow. Going back to the car. garage, taking the car to the garage. I'm going to have to get the official. Oh, he gets right in the back of the... Get hit well, here. He's, he must get hit, I think. He's kind of right in harm's way. Somebody's going to clip him. Now, okay. there's where you don't want to be, looking at the oncoming no, traffic. No, that's not good at all. That's, there it is, here it is. Oh, oh the 94. Oh, it's a 94. Yeah, Turner 94. Motorsports. That's a car that's been leading in GTD. Uh -huh. And it just drove right oh, through boy. the right front wheel and tire. See how dusty it is, the sandy soil here around Sebring. They've been running water trucks on the grass verges to try to keep that dust down. We talked about patience, Bob. I mean, they're the sort of instance you just got to wait. I know you've been sitting there for five seconds, but you just have to wait. You suddenly yeah. accelerate when the pack's coming through. That's what's going right. to happen. Change everybody's arc. There's the 94. Look at the damage he's suffered. Wow. This car, this... Uh Z4 and GT3 spec that they brought over. Mark VDS campaigned this car over in Europe, and uh, it was pretty bulletproof at Daytona. They had an electrical issue with the red taillights, lost them a bit of, was it taillights? There was something was wrong with the lights, and I think uh, the driver wasn't aware which switch to use, so they lost about three laps in the pits, but on pace it was pretty good, and uh, they said the car seemed awfully strong, but damage right now as he hits pit lane. Watch this now, you'll be able to see what happens where he hits him. Right here. Whoa! You know, well, I'm, that was I'm, from the Viper on board the 45. See, Lux accelerates forward and right into the path of the Z4. Yeah, I'm very surprised at this point in the race at the driver errors that we've seen. These all these wrecks have been driver error uh, situations. Paul Dallalana behind the wheel, but he really couldn't do anything. Nope. No, he didn't no. expect the but 25 car suddenly to move forward. It's like you say, though, Calvin. I mean, it's it's, it's patience. You, they're, they're not giving each other enough room and. You know, they're making bad calls, judgment calls. This car is going to be down for a while. And so Portolicchio's eight-star racing team. Got a stout driver line up there for this race, too. Mm -hmm. They'll need that right front. You know, they, they'll change out that right front corner and put a nose on it, but it's just going to take some time. Tom Kimber-Smith, Sean Rahal, Mike Marcel share the car with Eric Lux. It was uh, pretty stout when you got to have uh, two silver guys in your lineup. That's about as strong as you can get. They race on both sides of the Atlantic, including WEC World Endurance Championship competition. GTLM Corvette versus GT America Porsche from GTD. I'm going to have to check into these silver salaries, Cal. I might have to <laughs> come out of retirement, eh? Yeah, I know a guy that's silver. Well, that's the irony is that it's supposed to be pro-am. You're not yeah. supposed to ruin your living. And everyone's <laughs> saying, hey, you take my silver status away. Well, I can't earn a living. <laughs> Another traffic jam on the straight. I don't know that they could switch me from silver either. I'm too old. <laughs> You're, a, you're guaranteed a silver. That's, That's what right. Stefan Johansson has right now. He's XF1 and still races regularly, but because he's over 55 years old, 
He's a silver. Oh, Look how tight that there. is. Oh boy. A couple of Audis going at it. It's Paul Miller Racing, number 48. See that? And that's what I'm talking about. They're not leaving each other enough room. Had he touched that quarter panel and that Audi went in the wall, it would have come right back out and gotten him too. Yeah. So I mean, that's by the risk. What, what's the point? It's a tricky exit to turn one. It's, a, it's such a fine line, though, Dorsey, because yeah. if you get too conservative with this many cars, I mean, yeah, they go, they all freight train you. Yeah, they freight train you, and you're going to go backwards. Look here. Yeah, you don't just, lose one spot. Just a little bit of patience. Suddenly the 32's down the inside and diving by you. Past the Aston Martin of Chris Wilson. Well, one of the drivers said it earlier. I mean, it's a 12-hour race, but they turned it to a sprint race pretty much. You run barely, you know, as hard as you can the whole entire stint. But this year it's taken its toll, no doubt. Ford here again, Spencer Pumpelli behind the wheel. They came so close to victory, of course, at Daytona. Had it for a couple hours, and then it was taken away from them in terms of the reversal of the decision about the... Uh-oh, the 90s in trouble on the oh, back straight. Boy. You know, last year we only had four cautions. We're already working past six, and we're not even halfway. There's no drive in this car. Rocky yeah. behind the wheel. Reigning DTM champion. You, want, you heard cranking. It's cranking, yeah. The engine quit on him. Told him to cycle it, turn everything off, let it sit, turn it back on. And these are the, these are the sort of issues when you're the third driver and you're not running these cars on a regular basis. You hope that all of these type system the failures, off, procedures. Turn it back on have been discussed with you. Yeah. Well, that's that's one thing it. you get in the car and go quick, but if you have problems, right. what do I do? It's the same thing with that paddle shift thing we're talking about when you saw the Porsche stuck. I mean, there's procedures you have to go through to get that out of that locked up scenario. Talking about Le Mans win here, current DTM champ. He's had so much experience, but this right. car may be a little bit different. Not even recycling. trying to fire them. I'm sure he's turned everything off and on. A lot of these have resettable circuit breakers on them, too, instead of fuses. And you, know, you can go over there if he doesn't know that, like you're talking about, Calvin, that he can reset those buttons. But you have to push them. Can't do anything. The game we spoke about at the head of the show, Sebring, it's rough, it's brutal. You've got to send the monster off and on. Send the ignition off and on and try restarting it. Pitted eight laps ago. I haven't seen the headlights go. There he goes. Okay, now he's turned it off. Now he's got it recycled. Let's see if it fires. And obviously not. Nope. Most of these cars have two ignition systems. We know if it was if it's not restarting, or if he can get it to idle, see if he can get it in on idle. He's already gone a lap down. Then I switched it off, like you said, and since then I can't start it anymore. I did the cycle a few times. There's one other thing he could do, which is... Uh, drive on the starter. That's what I was about to say. He's drive on the starter. Put it in gear. Yeah, at least get back to the pits, which are right around the corner. You know, you can you can start it off by driving on the starter in first, quickly get it to second or third, and then get it rolling quick enough. We've got a full course yellow now. Again, Another full seven. course caution. Our seventh. Cover Mike Rockenfeller and the number 90 prototype. And you know he's. Tell me what to do. What do I do? What do I do? Good. We give you a flat toe, flat toe back to the pit box at this stage. Is there anything I can try still? I believe so. I do not believe so. He wants so desperately to, to try something else, anything. Needs his teammate to nose up behind him and push him that 100 yards back up there. Of course, they get a penalty. Nah, there's no fire there.
With one third of this Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring in the can, it's time to check the points in the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Cup. Remember the award points at the one third, two third, and race completion marks through one third. Here's how they stand. So a great battle there, didn't we, between the O2 and the 5? It seemed like both of them wanted to get that maximum five-point bonus. It will also be awarded at the eight-hour mark, and then however they finish overall tonight. And then in uh, Prototype Challenge, 52 car got the five bonus points, but since that time, they've been involved in that big wreck in turn 17, so it'll be a struggle for those guys to even get back out and score any more points here today. In GT Le Mans, we talked about the strategy. The SRT Motorsport team kept Van Bakker out there, and he scored the maximum bonus points there. And Turner Motorsport started on the pole here. They grabbed the five bonus points in GTD. And in addition to the entire TPNAEC championship, there are individual race award winners. So those teams have the early leg up in the competition to be round two winners here at Sebring. We'll be back in a moment. Sad news for the 90 Corvette DP team as we welcome you back to the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Mike Rockefeller being pushed into the spirit of Daytona paddock garage area. A moment ago, he tried to describe to the team over the radio what happened when the car originally let him down. Before corner 16, I shifted down one gear. Apex, I tried to apply throttle and there was nothing happening and then the thing was running in idle. And that's where he is. The car has and now I been towed the in. Master off, back on, and it's not restarting. And that we knew. Let's see if we can learn more with Troy Fliss, with the team, and Andrew. Well, I'm not sure we're going to, actually. Can we learn anything more? We've just heard Mike uh, telling you what the problem was, but uh, at the moment, not a solution. Yeah, well, just uh, right now, they're going to plug into and see. We just lost the electronic death of control there. And, um, you know, very disappointed for the Visit Florida folk and Chevrolet. Uh, we had a good car, and I think uh, it's a beautiful day here today, and <laughs> we're hopefully having a good finish. But uh, Well, we're in Florida. Of course, it's a beautiful day. Great. It's a beautiful place. But, uh, you know, so disappointed for all them and, uh, and his team working so hard. And, you know, just some of these new things that we don't have a lot of experience on and, you know, haven't seen anything like this yet. So this is the first time we had any uh, gremlins of the electronic throttle control stuff. So we'll uh, see what we can do. So you're behind the wall, and so too is Muscle Milk. So some of the big names having troubles here at Sebring. But we know it's uh, only half as long as Le Mans, but some say it's twice as difficult. Yeah, it's always tough. Thanks, guys. Well, these throttles are fly-by-wire throttles, and so there's a throttle position sensor, TPS they call it, uh, that fails, or if it fails on the other side, on the computer module side, it doesn't get the signal from the throttle pedal that uh, we want to get going here. Don't know why it wouldn't start, though. It was idling uh, in neutral before, but when Rocky shut it off, it was truly off. So it's going to be an electronic glitch, and it shouldn't be much to fix either. I wonder if the glitch caused a fuel pressure problem of some sort. Troy Fliss, one of the guys like the man who owns that car, Michael Shank, a guy who pulled himself up by his bootstraps in this sport. He probably deserves better than what he's getting today here at Sebring. The car's been quick. He's been running uh, mid-53s, and uh, Justin Wilson, who was with the squad at Daytona, he's here, obviously, as the third driver. A.J. Allmendinger busy elsewhere this weekend. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have been part of Mike Shank's driver lineup. Saw the world premiere of the Need for Speed at the Detroit Auto Show, and I can tell you one thing about all those cars in there. They fly more than the old uh, Duke's a Hazard car. I, mean, <laughs> I hope people don't really yeah. re realize that their cars can't do that, what they do in that, yeah, in that exactly. show. Exactly. Every time I see the trailer, I think, oh, my goodness. Spectacular action, though. Yeah, with Aaron Paul starring. Yeah. Sure it's big fun. Speaking of big fun, Justin Wilson, all, what, six, six of him, <laughs> folded into that car. He's got to have his knees up behind the steering wheel, I would think. Yeah. Flexible as an acrobat. General Lee. That's You'll make it work, about. though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get you want the ride, you're going to make it there. work. That's right. Justin's an interesting story. Early in his career, when he was racing in Formula One, he actually sold shares in himself. He incorporated. People could contribute money, and they got a slice of whatever he made down the road. Well, I tried that, and I lost money on myself. <laughs> <laughs> you need to pick your stocks better. Yeah, wasn't too good at that. Hey, pit lane is open. Seeing a few takers. 
comes the 31 Whalen car. Only about nine lap, uh, 11 Oops. laps, excuse me, on the board for many of these prototype machines. So they're deciding to stay out and keep the track position. And this is turning into a real endurance situation. I'm telling you, with all the crashes we've had and so forth, all you need to do is just keep going. Forget about where you yeah. where you are right now. I mean, we've got a long way to go. We're not even halfway in this 12-hour uh, event. There's the 07 Mazda. Beautiful great to see car. that. Great to see that Mazda brought back uh, young Ben Devlin. He was part of the Mazda squad with Dyson back in 2009. In fact, the last uh, four race he did here was Petit Le Mans, which he won. And then has disappeared off the North American sports car scene for a while. But uh, he's from my hometown in Attleboro and saw him this past winter. He said, I'm itching to get back. And uh, all credit for John Doonan in uh, realizing that Hinchcliffe wasn't going to be available this weekend and drafting Ben back into the squad. And they said, you know what? He's really given us some great direction with this car because he's really the only guy on a driver lineup who's driven these P2, particularly the Lola. Uh, for a lot of miles, so um, it's been a great addition, and hopefully we'll see more of it. Glad to see him back. Usually when you stay out of the race car too long, you've got two or three kids all of a sudden. Uh, the Corvette is out. Speaking of young drivers, while you're on IMSA.com, if that's how you're watching our live streaming coverage, open another window and click on over to SafeIsFast.com. S-A-F-E stands for Safe, Assured, Fit, and Empowered. It is a treasure of a site built and maintained by the Road Racing Drivers Club, an organization of former drivers, current drivers, and personalities from around the world of motorsports, supported by the FIA, the International Federation in Paris. And it has just a, a wealth of video tutorials on what it takes to be a young race car driver, a young technician, sponsor hunter, you name it. Check it out, safeisfast.com. And the club really uh, supports a lot of young drivers, and if Dorsey would just pay his dues, we could probably <laughs> support him. Really? Yeah, I'm good now. We're good. in the red. I actually bought You're the good. shirt. I bought the shirt and everything. You did? Yeah, <laughs> and the pin. Not like paying the tax man back. You got a deal? If well, I had to cut a deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, proud to be a, uh, an honorable member of the community since I never drove. And, uh, but even I am really proud of what that organization is accomplishing in terms of educating people about the realities of racing. Bobby Rahal, president of the RDC, of course, also the owner of the RLL BMWs here at Sebring. John Fergus heavily involved. His son That's Corey right. raced here yesterday in the He's Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge yep. Who series. Sent me all those bills. Jeremy Shaw does a lot of great work for the whole group, particularly sending these uh, young drivers over to Europe and uh, giving them great experience. That's right. We do have a little fun every year at our annual dinner at Daytona on the weekend of the Rolex 24. And they also have a big function coming up yeah. at Long, Long Beach. Beach. I think Mario Andretti. Honoring Mario Andretti. Yeah, yeah sure. It'll be great. You going, Dawes? It's a little steep for me, that one. A little steep, yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, the Mazda in trouble. The is this the one that just left the diesel? pits? Oh, it's a problem with the left rear. So I think the left rear is loose. That's Tristan Nunez in the car, so this is not yeah, the car that Denver's out. getting in. The wheel is about to fall yeah, off. He's caught it yeah. in time. It's coming off of the uh, of the pins, off the drive pins. Yeah, as though the uh, center hub was not all the way on. I'm in plain view of it right now. Now well, there you see the time remaining. Six hours, 51 minutes on the button. Take a break and return with more. Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. We are back at the 62nd Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring, fueled by Fresh from Florida. There you see the reason for the current yellow flag, Tristan Nunez in the 07 Mazda Sky Active diesel turbo is being towed around yeah. After the young Floridian pulled the car to the stop on the side of the road, you'll see why in a second. Yes, exactly. And I think this is not a good thing to be towed because the left rear wheel is trying to fall off and it's going to fall off if they don't do something with it. See how it's sticking out from the fender mm -hmm. floor? Is it, is it more like a... I can't tell if it's flopping. Yeah, it looks like it's still on the hub, like everything has just moved it's left. turning, yeah. Something's definitely broken, though. It, yeah, you're right, Kevin. It could be off the pegs, though. It could be, off the... It could be a lot more serious than pegs. <laughs> No, there's no nut on it. There's no oh, nut yeah. On it. Oh, no. man. It's, it's going to fall off. Oh, yeah, it will fall goodness. off as soon as he turns Nut's right. supposed to be right in there. Yeah. And it's, right. of course, not there anymore. 
Oh, and that's it. See, it's broken. Shoot yeah, it's off. got the broken. Uh, yeah. It's got a the broken upright axle. is broken. It's or an the, axle. The shaft. Yeah, the shaft. Oh, no, it's it's lathing itself right now as we speak. Yeah. Here it goes. Here it comes. Hey, there's something broken. There's something broken. Yep. Yes, copy, copy. Slow down. 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 It's going to fall off. It's trying really hard. Yeah, relay me. What's broken? The drive pins are holding it right now. There's like it's five pins that are pushing out, it. But that's about it. Just a little bit of white smoke. Nothing major that I see. I don't see any fluid down. Just a little bit of If he were to put smoke. his brake on, of course, he doesn't know this, but he put his brake on and straighten that out a little oh, bit. Oh, it's trying to come off. Of course, this is a turbo diesel. It generates tremendous yes, torque. Yes, it does. Yeah. You can see it's been lathing around in there. Like I said, look at all the mm -hmm. shiny part yes. up inside the, inside the wheel itself. And I think that's the axle you see flopping around in there. Yeah, it's, the pace it's already here. something amiss. You can see him kind of crabbing his truck controller, keeping it in a straight line. He's he checking. realizes something's wrong. Yeah, he's yeah. looking around. Making sure nobody's near him. Cause checking the mirror. Good heads up driving right there. Looks like that's as far as he's going to be able he's to go. He's going to need a flatbed. You know, just put it on a flatbed and bring it back to the pits. They can change that axle out and get him back underway. But if the wheel falls off, then he could do even more damage with body work and so forth. Talking to John Doon, and obviously just much like last year with the GX class when they had problems early in the season and went on a tear winning races, uh, he said it's very much a development program, production-based engine, of course, and... Uh, if they try and run any more power through it, it's just really not built for it. They're yeah. looking at maybe doing some uh, new components later in the year, but there's a big lead time on all of that. So very proud they got 15 and a half hours with one car, 22 and a half with the other at Daytona. And um, it's just small goals at the moment. Yeah. They're just uh, trying to work towards the future. Yeah, there, there it goes. Go. Our, his biggest hurdle is actually that he's trying to run this program using stock components. Now, he could also have gone into that program and used all racing stuff, you know, fabricated for the car, but he's trying to use stock stuff, and, uh, and that stock stuff isn't ready right, to do Right, about 70% is stock parts in the engine. I guess they're going to try to limp it all the way around on the grass. Well, loose wheels have been a bit of a problem all weekend. Just ask the technical director for the historic sports racing series. Dorsey, that's you. Well, see, that's not only half the problem. There goes the other half of the problem. Wow, right I think I'd be far in my pick at this stage. Really? Yeah. yeah he I, drove the wheels right off that one. That's nutty. <laughs> Whoa. Thought it was going to clear the and tire. And there goes the wheel nut, too, running down the racetrack behind the wheel. Well, at least it had the decency to leave the racing surface. This was not, I don't think this is a, bro uh, a nut that no. was loose. So this is an actual snapped. broken part. Yeah. Yeah. You can see it laid ground in there. The hub just came out. And like we said, also milk did, nice. did 15 and a half, 22 and a half hours at Daytona. <laughs> yeah. Five and a half, well, that's maybe it. here Sebring. at uh, Sebring. It's, it, they say it's like four times as tough. It is. I mean, it, <laughs> if anything's weak, you'll find it. This is good news to see these guys back out. This is a big effort, not only for Greg Pickett and his team, no one, but no also no for Nissan. Jump. It's Nismo Radio check. Can you hear me? Motorsports Program. Radio check. Darren Law. Let's go. Hey, guys. Go, go, go. They, uh, they, they, don't, they didn't tell me exactly what happened, but they said it was something driveline related. I don't know if it was in the tranny, in the axles, in the diff or whatever, but uh, they had to go back to the pits to get the part repaired. So they just came up, topped it up, and they're, they're back out again. That's Sebring for you. I mean, the driveline takes a pommel here. We just keep saying it and saying it, but it's until you drive around here yourself, you just cannot appreciate how unbelievable it is. There's no street anywhere. Even Detroit's got streets better than this, and that's hard to say. Well, and Greg Pickett is the first to recognize that this is a development program. They were actually an extended an invitation to come race at the 24 Hours of Le Mans in June, and he declined because he didn't think the team was ready. Well, you don't want to um, compromise the program you got going on over here. They're going for a championship, no doubt about it. They realize it's going to be a tall order with a brand new car and a new series, new category car they haven't run before but they still believe firmly they can be in contention and if you go to Lamar it's such a draw on the resources from everyone not just financially but all of the group and in the middle of the season so uh, I think it's a smart call I think next year will be a much better 
time to go and try and do that trip. Plus, he's having fun on his yacht in the Caribbean, so it's kind of hard to get away from all that. Okay. <laughs> Stack right, up here. here they we want go. that pace car to get off the road. Four day behind the wheel. DL. Let's see which car is going to come to life first. Usually, the Daytona-based things, a heavier car, has the advantage on restart. Like Memo Rojas was looking Look racy. How rough it is when we're down Boy. on that inside. That's a great shot, and that really puts it in perspective. Get up out of here. Here we go. Look at this, though. Justin Wilson looking for a way by Sage Karam. The need for speed, number 60. That's a good speed shot there. Gives you an idea how quick these guys are going. Oh, a little, little bit of lock up there by Sage yeah. Karam as he gets in really deep and he runs wide. Oh. You saw him lock the brake up a little bit. And there's Wilson right on him, but Karam somehow manages to hold him off. Yeah, he got in there really deep. You saw a puff of tire smokes. He got on the brakes really deep and that running wide into the next corner. He hung on to it, but this is what Mike Carl was telling Chris Neville. They said, be patient, be patient, but he's a, <laughs> a young driver with a lot of passion, a lot of speed. He's oh, run wide, wide again. again. Yep. And he locked up again. Oh, this is going to be tight. This is going to be tight. He's got to give it up. Oh, yeah? yeah he's going to uh, fight. Yeah, but Justin's going to have the inside line for the next break zone. Right-hander coming up. Yep. Turn 10. Yeah, I'll get him right there. Still doesn't want to give it to him. Yeah, now that's how you do it. Maintain space all the way. I'm sure race control was loving that. That's great racing. Remember, he was talking about that car being tight, that we're going to do something to try to loosen it up. I don't know that they haven't gotten a bit too loose. It seems like the back of the car dancing a bit. Yeah, I just think it was maybe the tires just weren't up to temp yet, yeah. or they just didn't have the balance yet. I mean, there's not much you can do under these caution pairs. You can work. Most guys, you see the guys weaving around. That's really just to clean the tires off. Warming the tire, you're better off to really just brake, brake really heavily. Try and get the heat to go through the brake system, through the wheel itself, and then into the tire to heat it up. Somebody slow in the straight again with the Astons. The Astons, the 007 car. Be curious to see here how the 02 and the 01 match up in pace. So far in this race, the 02 has had a good second plus on the sister car. Let's see what Rojas has for them in this stint. Like riding a bucking Bronco down there in 17 and just jumping and bucking and carrying on. And Nine car there going through the shot. John Fogarty behind the wheel. He was Mamo Gidley's teammate in the Red Dragon at Daytona, along with Darren Law and Alex Gurney. So sad not to see Alex Gurney in action there this weekend. Yeah. There's Red Dragon and uh, Gainesco uh, racing operations owner Bob Stallings said we can't be here. We're unsure if we're going to see them again this year. Hopefully we will at some point in the future at le least. But uh, John Fogarty's been drafted into the number nine car, and I spoke to Brad Frizzell, father of uh, Brian and Bert Frizzell. He's pretty angry at lunch today. He said that... Uh, the Porsche factory team had a problem with one of their cars and had their car parked in their pit spot. They had to move it a little bit, not all the way out, and that really screwed up one of their pit stops. And they, in fact, got a penalty because uh, one of the Frizzell boys took off with the jack still under the car, which they had to use to actually get him into his pit box so they could refuel. So uh, I think there were some angry words between the Porsche factory squad and Action left Express during that exchange. Yeah, that Audi had a left front down, so that's limping in. That's the 35. They had a past winner of this race, too, for that matter. The father you're talking about of the Frizzell sons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Through the Lamar corner, onto the back straight. 60 cars uh, looking pretty stout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Both these cars, Ford powered, of course. Been some adjustments since Daytona. They made some adjustments to the Daytona prototypes in general prior to Daytona, and uh, the Ford guys were pretty adamant that that was going to hurt the turbocharged engines more than the uh, normally aspirated Chevy, so they've uh, backtracked that on a little bit, pegged the Chevys back, and uh, given the Fords a bit more boost, a bit more restrictor. Yeah. Looks like the Ford guys have done a good job getting their manifold problems situated and, and the overheating in the back of the car. The Audi has made it to the pits. Darren Law's there. Guys, uh, Seth Nyman just got out of the car and uh, he got hit. It looks like they've got a flat tire. They've got some definite damage on the rear diffuser, right rear. That thing's all broken up in the back side of it, which you know is going to really hurt the downforce for those things. They rely on that for grip. So they're basically doing a tire change, looking it over, and they're going to send them back out. 
Massive oh, yeah. diffuser on the Audi. It sticks all the way out. It looks like a Batmobile. I was about to say that. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> well, easy to damage it when it sticks that far outside. On the, the, on car. the prototype cars, that's a thousand pounds of downforce right there. On these, these GT cars, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if the numbers aren't very much the same. That's why a lot of them, the, particularly the Fords, have those front dive planes to help balance the car to account for that thousand pounds at the rear. This is a cool story, Bob. Oh, yeah. The tie dye special, Rum Bum Racing. <laughs> Hugh Plum. Driving with his brother Matt, Jan Halen, and young Madison Snow. It's actually a conglomeration of three teams. All good teams. Snow Racing, yep, Wright Motorsports, and Rumbum. Seems like they're all getting along well so far. Madison John Snow. Wright is certainly a great, great car prep organization. And uh, you add Giovanni to the mix in terms of strategy and uh, stellar driver lineup for a yeah. pro-am class. Madison really Snow, good. A, a young guy, you know, who has really impressed us, Calvin, and all the things that he's done uh, in his Porsches. His mom and dad both drive. And, but Madison is really talented. I mean, he's, he's the real deal. And Jan Halen is really quick as well. Uh, he's a guy who kind of slipped through the net, really. Could have had a stellar uh, single-seater career, but just uh, went away from him. There's the 912 Porsche factory 911 RSR, leader in the GT Le Mans class. Boy, it looked nice and compliant through the S's there, didn't it? I mean, it just rolled up on the curb and rolled back the other way. Bit of damage on the right front of Joey Hand's car there. He's running second, I think. That black Crown Plaza BMW looked to yeah, the yeah. right front corner. It's sticking out a little bit like he's got in this. Yep, it certainly has. Yes, the front bumper is coming askew. So, right. been some argy bargy there. On board with Joey. Regular competitor now for BMW in the DTM. Uh, uh, slim is scheduled down a little bit here in the States, just doing uh, Daytona, Sebring, and Petit Le Mans, and then really focusing on the DTM champs. It'll be his third year. Yep. There's been some changes. They're going to run the M4 over there this uh, this year. So Joey's very excited to be back with the RBM squad and uh, looking for great things this year. It's got to be tough racing on both sides of the pond. It's a long way from California. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, the trip last States. week was 28 hours. Ah. That's just, that's forget the door to door. That was just flight to flight to well, finish the trip. That's what it takes me to go 300 miles. Well, yeah. <laughs> you stop off a lot, does he? <laughs> He's got the family with him this weekend. They're having quite a vacation. They were to be touring Florida in one of those customized buses. But the bus was not available. It broke. So they're How having unusual. to go to Plan B. <laughs> <laughs> Digging up hotel rooms and traveling as best they can to get from point to point, including, of course, Joey's drive here at Sebring. This is a great story. Falcon Tire on debut with this new Porsche. Haven't had a lot of time with it, but Marco Halter currently holding down the third spot. And the Falcon Tires really struggled to really maintain rear grip, and uh, the Porsche had a similar problem, so you combine those together, they struggled last year, particularly on the long runs, but they've really worked hard on the new Porsche design to give it more rear stability, and uh, talking to the guys in driving and testing, they said the balance has gone the other way, if anything, so I think they may have something to say this year about being competitive at all of the circuits. Interestingly, it's the only car of its type in independent hands, and that says a lot for Falcon Tire and, and, their, uh, and Porsche's... Uh, Ability to trust them. There's Ryan Hunter Ray in the first of the SRT Vipers. Now the other Porsche behind is not on the same lap. So it's Viper Viper in fourth and fifth. Ryan Hunter Ray in the 91 and Rob Bell of England in the 93. Yeah, the other Porsche has had some kind of delay. He's way down the order right now. Currently wow. running in 40th position overall, Richard Leitz. Viper got a good run off that corner 17. Opened up a couple car lengths there. I was not expecting that to happen. Bigger, heavier car, but you know what? They've done a great job with the chassis. Look through here, as rough as it is, those cars stay pretty flat. Talking to the SRT drivers, they seem to think they really couldn't find the right tire combat combination for the daytime hours. They're hoping to just stay close to that lead lap and hoping they can put some softies on tonight and be competitive for the last couple of hours. So I think it's just a game of patience, keeping it near the lead. Don't seem to have the outright pace right now until things cool down and maybe they can go to some softer rubber. Big old torquey V10 there in those Vipers. Also use that engine in a lot of boat applications now with uh, Gilmore from IndyCar fame building uh, those Viper V10s for boats. It's such good racing. I mean, in all four classes, this GTLM, re really factory, uh, 
organizations all the way through other than the Falcon Tire squad and obviously Reese, but a lot of big factories represented there. Then you got this GTD class, which I think is the sleeper class. There's so many outstanding finishing yeah. drivers this year. So much competition, high caliber teams. You know, you look at the equipment at Daytona when we were walking around for the first round, it's like, wow, yeah. these are great, great cars. That's, that's what we kept saying, wow. Wish I had one of those, wow, wish I had one of those. <laughs> All those blue number plates, and here comes the prototype. Squeezing around the outside. Let's go to Greg Kramer. Well, guys, I think one of the good stories that's developing here is that of the number 44 Flexbox Magnus Porsche. Andy, uh, you guys ended up qualifying in 10th, which is a little bit farther back sometimes than you guys are used to, but you're a fighter, man. You do the jiu-jitsu or whatever, and this has turned into an absolute brawl here. That's your kind of racing. You guys were up and forth, just got nicked back a spot, but still a good day. Yeah, it's, uh, Potter's doing really good out there, running running really strong for our Flexbox Porsche here. Uh, we're just getting to that halfway point, and everybody's going to be turning it up a little bit. We've seen a lot of action as it is, but now I think you're going to see it really heat up and really get crazy. I want to say a quick happy birthday to my dad who's watching at home. I, I didn't get a chance to see him today. Uh, his birthday is tomorrow. It's uh, it's going to get heated. we got a bunch of different manufacturers up there. And it's going to be tough to tell which one's going to come out on top. You've been relatively unscathed so far, too, and that's a big part of this, isn't it? Yeah, we got, we got unceremoniously dumped off uh, turn 13 there. We've got a little damage on the right front. Bonded a screen on to keep the radiator from getting any rocks into it. Other than that, we're in pretty good shape. Mechanically, knock on wood, uh, this Porsche is running really good, so it's just got to keep pushing to the end. What he described today is relatively unscathed. It's been crazy. Thanks, Andy. Good luck. Thank you. Ironically, I John Travolta did his name the other day in the broadcast when I named him <laughs> Randy Lally. <laughs> There's the flat 45, tire. the second flat tire in the last, what, hour or so. Yeah. With a flying lizard. Uh, I think this is the racetrack now. I mean, all the debris, all the crashes we've had. And here's where you damage that yes. diffuser when yeah. you're sitting on the ground. Hey, guys, uh, 45 cars coming back down pit lane. This will be the second flat tire they've had during the race. The 35 car of the Lizards has also had flat tires. You know, I mean, you could maybe put it down to debris, but these cars, this team, has had more than any of the others. You know, is it in setup? Is it debris? I'm not sure, but they are really having a tough time keeping the tires under this thing. Well, the other problem is if you have any bodywork that's kind of a, a stray and is being taped on, it can get loose again and cut down a tire. So you got to make sure you get a proper fix done. A little debris do right there in the radiator, Cal, mm -hmm. in the lead car. This Fair. is what's interesting. This is, you know, we haven't seen really a good long green flag run here, and this is going to be one of the questions. How would the tire degradation be on the Daytona prototype versus the P2? Now, traffic is playing a factor throughout the course of this run, but it certainly looks like Dial is closing in on Bourdais a little bit. Took six tenths out of him on a pretty competitive lap for both drivers on the last run here. So maybe the P2 lighter weight is not going to abuse the tires quite as much to wait and see how it plays out. American brand with a French driver battling a Japanese brand with a Scottish driver. Ryan, of course, has won here at Sebring before. WEC category of P2 a couple of years ago. What a year he had that year. Just uh, seemed to win everything. Winding it up in traffic on the back stretch. There you see the gap between them. They've been running close together for several laps in a row now. Lots of GT traffic on the front straightaway <laughs> now, and here comes Bourdais. Looks like a restart almost. Yeah, looking for a path underneath one of the GTD Aston Martins, closing in on a GTD Porsche. Now the gap in terms of top speed between the prototypes and the GTD cars is about 15 to 20 miles an hour. Patience, guys, that's what it takes. You see it right there. Actually, probably a good bit more than that. A little luck of help. Around the outside goes prototype. So Alex Job cars running line astern, the 22 and 23 for sixth and seventh right now. Alex had so much success here at Sebring, as he has in all the big Enduros. So uh, looking to add to that tally here this weekend. On the 60, Justin Wilson. 
three Ford Power cars in the top five right now. So it's uh, Chevy leads from HPD, then Ford, Ford, and Ford. Look at that prototype working the outside of three Porsches. Uh, Sage Karam, yeah. Sage is, brave young man. Yeah, I'd say that's about right. He's probably loving it though. That's yeah. good slippery out there. You can, I've seen guys do that, make that outside pass through that left hand or never get back, you know, just get out there and push wide. Everyone loves to overtake. And when you come to the single seeker ranks, sometimes you, if you have a big race, you might have two or three passes. <laughs> You're yeah. going to have several hundred. Yeah, all the time passing. Man, look at this crowd. That is a very tight corner leading onto the back stretch. You got to be so careful to make an outside sweeper pass like that with all the dirt on the on the racetrack. There goes Bourdais, three wide. Look, look at that GTD oh, car. That GTD car pulls yeah. right in front of him. Yeah, but that, that's the thing, you know, they have good top speed, so there yep. wasn't a big difference in speed there. But when you get to the brake zone, the carbon fiber brakes on the. Uh, Sorry, the carbon brakes, not carbon fiber, right? Carbon brakes on the uh, prototype machine just allows him to bury it into that corner and with the downforce as well. So then there's a big speed difference. That's what I was saying at the beginning of the show. We've never had this many cars with as close to parity. And I'm talking about through the all four classes, the cars on their top speed are very, very close. There's the prototype's corner so much better than the production based machinery. There's never a dull moment, that's for sure. No. Always some action with 60 plus cars starting this race today. Or the 01, Memo Rojas going by, GTD Porsche. Michael Garra said we're on a slightly different strategy to the 02, and uh, it's showing on the stopwatch right now. I'm just curious to see if they're just really thinking about the championship of the 01 and just trying to let the hours click by and let him loose towards the end of this race today. A tough day for these BMW boys, the 56 car in the pits again. What are you seeing, Darren? Yeah, you guys, it's been a tough day again. Up on jacks, suspension issues. They had the right front upright pulled apart with the lower control arm off of it. So I don't know if they broke something or what they were repairing. They actually had an upright sitting here ready to put on, but it looks like they repaired whatever happened in that right front corner and uh, sent them back on the way. Yeah, they had damage on the left front with Dirk Mueller behind the wheel uh, right around the same time as Malicelli's big crash down in turn one. But when we looked at the video highlights and replays, we couldn't see that BMW ever involved. So I don't know if there was some debris, a big piece of a race car out on the racetrack somewhere that he run into, but he certainly wasn't part of the initial action at least. So a bit of a mystery on that one. There was plenty of things out there to hit. That's for sure for a while with all the wrecks we had and tires and just the tire debris that's yeah. out there is unbelievable. You hit a carcass, that, that yeah. can do some uh, suspension Definitely. damage to a car if you do it at speed. Yeah, it cups out underneath the car and wraps up around everything and the tire gets a hold of it. And the next thing you know, it's torn everything up. Look at this. Yeah, it's a good battle right here. Yeah. Fogarty all over the back of Mamo Rojas there. There's no love loss between these two guys. No, no. Remember, years past, I think Mexico City all started when they were beating on doors, going down the front straightaway there. Oh, Fogarty looking for a way around the outside. Won't get that done. He's going to not leave the door open, otherwise he's going to be passed from behind. That's right. That's oh, Gustavo Yakuman. Yeah, he's trying to get up underneath there. Well, Rojas has got all his best friends around him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. He'd be they were like magnets mid-season oh, last year. Gosh. It seemed like every race they were into each other. Started at Detroit and we had mid-Ohio and uh, never seemed to end. He better be looking in the mirror when he sees that. That's all you want to hear. You got John for Oh, he's oh, all over the oh, dirt. Oh. He's all over the curb there. And uh, Yakuman gets right, a run Yakuman. past them both. I think they might have touched there. Might have hurt the car. He might have hurt the car. Rojas slowing down. He got really uh, wide on the curb there and lost momentum. Yeah, he clouded that curb pretty hard. Yeah. Looks so like he's up to speed. Maybe just try to get yeah. the tires cleaned yeah, off. That's what I'm he's thinking. at 100%, but certainly close to it. Cleaning up the rubber. No, no, no. They actually burst their hit me from behind. And then it got stuck in gear. I don't know what happened. Stuck in gear. Couldn't change gears. That's why he lost momentum. Got hit from behind. I wonder if he was about to change when he yeah, got hit and have. did something, jammed it. Try, or he might have shifted it without being on throttle, which yeah. would jam it sometimes up. He was in too tall a gear. That's why he couldn't accelerate. Now it looks okay. He's shifting fine. But he's lost two positions. So the order is Bourdais, Dial, Karam, then Justin Wilson. 
Yakuman, Fogarty, and Rojas. Let's see what happens. Well, that's very strange. And he just didn't turn in. Yeah. Oh, he's Whoa. stuck in gear. Yeah, he could yeah. stuck in it. gear, and then Fogarty got into him, I think. Yeah, that's exactly what it did. It stuck in gear, and he could have shifted. Didn't rest. have any speed. Fogarty had nowhere to go and got into him, and Yakuman just got a run. And there's Yakuman dodging to the right in the black and pink car. There goes something. He yep. ran over. Bit of chunk. Something comes off the. Yeah, he just Corvetta. he was all the way up against the rev limiter and it wouldn't shift. A glitch. See if it happens again. Fine there. Yeah. Despite the traffic. About 22 and a half minutes from the halfway point in what has been an eventful 60 second running of the Mobile One 12 hours of Sebring. Lots of smiles down in the pit area. Hopefully everybody having a good time at Sebring. Stay with us, we'll be back. You're looking at the most dominant team through one event and counting in the 2014 Tudor United Sports Car Championship. Corvette number five from Action Express won the season opener at Daytona, took pole for the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Here they are leading away. They've led much of this race. The car is currently in the hands of the man who put it on pole, Sebastian Bourdais. It's early days, Dorsey, we say in the championship. I mean, it seems like they got their act together. They were really good at the end of last year, too. You, you know, I, the momentum started building back then. Yep. And then when they came to Daytona, all those practice runs, you know, the roar before the 24, yep. they were strong. They've stayed strong. You know, this is the team to beat in my eyes right now. I think they really do, in fact, have it together. And they've made a lot of changes over the last couple of years with personnel, with driver lineups, and... Uh, they, they've really gone from strength to strength. Went on a bit of a tear last year. I think they had a couple of wins mid-season with Fittipaldi and Barbosa. And then they had a few uh, niggly problems, and uh, that took them out of the championship game, but certainly showed a lot of promise. And I know Christian in particular was pretty bullish about coming back this year and thought they would be a serious threat, which they're proving. And, you know, Sebastian Bourdais has really taken to the car. I mean, he just got in there, and he's been good the whole time. And I think he's comfortable in that car. You see it with the pole position here. Now, moments ago. Ooh. It's the 09 RSR. I guess the 46 just car. didn't have a clue he was there. I don't know. Yeah, I, th I don't think he could see him. I mean, he just turned right over the nose of him. Thank goodness for all that concrete runoff. A little battle here between Jordan Taylor and Simon Pagino. This is a battle for sixth spot in the prototype ranks. That could be interesting. Boy, what a year Jordan Taylor had last year. Three wins to finish out the year and take the championship with Angelelli. Action Express in pit lane. Darren? Guys, they, they uh, came in, they made a driver change. I don't know how long Fogarty was in, but it was basically a standard stop. Fuel, tires, Fogarty out. Nothing, uh, nothing substantial was going on there. Clean that paper off the grill that was there, so that's good. And they resume. You know, with the amazing amount of people that are here, and there's estimates close to 100,000, it's amazing that there isn't more debris on this racetrack when you think of all that's going on in the infield there. In case you're wondering why, it's an estimate, and they don't have a firmer number about the number of people in the facility, because you would not believe the vehicles that come, <laughs> and many of them are packed with folks yeah. in the back. It's a lot of people, I can tell you that, that infield in there. Tonight, you'll be able to see it pretty vividly. Well, we talk about a merger between the two series. I think we're also getting a merger between two groups Fan of fans. Faces. I mean, yep. you had fans who didn't yeah. go to Daytona who are ALMS fans, and you had, you know, Grand Am fans who didn't come to Sebring to watch the ALMS race. You're now getting both coming together to watch these cars. Back in the day, they used oh, to allow folks to queue up outside the gates, and some of them would do so as much as a month in advance. And they still do. They're still there. Now, now you're not allowed to hang out out there until March 1st, and they had about 500 people here two weeks ago waiting to get in. Greg Kramer. Well, very quickly, the number one Extreme Speed Motorsports Patron, HPD ARX, just in and out. Very quick stop, no problems. He just continued on. Now, we are anticipating that the number two is going to be coming in as well. But this stop under green, so obviously pretty important. They nailed it. Darren. 
John Fogarty just got out of the nine car. You guys are having a decent run, man. We saw during that run you came up on uh, on Rojas and you guys had a little contact. Yeah, I think he must be having a gearbox issue. He kept going straight. I think it's probably hanging up in, in a taller gear than he wants. He almost went straight off a few times, and coming out of the hairpin, he just kind of stopped accelerating, and I was right on his bumper. And, uh, you know, we got together, not intentional, but uh, they seem to be struggling with something out there. So, uh, but our car's okay. Uh, I hope it gets a little bit better come nightfall when the track cools down. The line that the car seems to want right now is not where the grip is. So uh, it's a little bit of a, a struggle. Now, what about Brian? I hear Brian's sick. Is it just you and Bert the rest of the race? Yep, it will be. But uh, I've been 20, doing 24-hour bike races, so I'm ready for this. <laughs> I know how that is. Wait a sec. What is this beard, man? That is like Mountain Man. That's yeah, Oregon. I don't know. Look. All right, these guys. I know how tough it is, you guys, out there with the, with the bumps and the heat. And doing it with just two people the rest of the way is going to be rough. I think a beard's a good look on John Fogarty. Certainly makes him look different, that's for sure. I have a comment, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> okay. Payback is going to be brutal. <laughs> too painful. Yeah, still trouble with the Aspen. Boy. Is this the, the o, uh, 007? No, 009, no, 009 this time. Now. Oh, yeah. boy. So both cars have been limping. Oh, oh well, that's the sort of move where you got to wait. These guys are really having a problem then just making it much worse by not being patient. You can't just drive into the path of an un, another race car seen it several times today and uh, there's damage and taking cars out of the action. I could have taken the whole front end oh. off there. Five is in at the Action Express hey. pits. Darren? Speaking of action, Action Express is running like clockwork right now. Sebastian Bourdais just got out and, uh, and Fittipaldi is in. The car looks totally clean. It looks very good. They're taking care of it and they're quick. Greg? Well, the 0-1 is in. Mimo Rojas getting out. Marino Franchini on board. Went for all four tires and fuel. The right front corner, a little bit of a hang-up. Getting that done. Close call down at the exit point as the number two Extreme Street Motorsports car clocking right out in front of him. But a very clean stop. Just that little hang-up on that right front corner. Seems like the P2 and the DP cars are getting very similar fuel mileage. I mean, these cars last pitted on the same lap so there doesn't seem to be any significant advantage one way or the other in terms of your fuel range so we can maybe take that off the table at the end of the day here's what greg was talking about here comes the ganassi car out comes the number two not too dangerous no it didn't look bad of course we weren't standing down there either well, that's true <laughs> Forward sounds cool. It, it does. does. Yeah, I was thinking that earlier on. Sounds we'll really clean, too. This was also the debut race for Honda's new entry in the three and a half liter twin turbo class, driving in the back of the Starworks Riley, but that car unfortunately is back in the paddock. Yeah, they're having the same teething problems that Ford did early on with uh, overheating with the turbocharged engine at the back of this uh, prototype that doesn't have a lot of air back there. Close battle here. Tony Kanan has taken over in the 02. Working through slower traffic. Let's join Greg Kramer with the man who got out. Well, guys, Tony's going to have his work cut out trying to match what this young man, Sage Karen, pulled off there. Uh, you, very racy early in your stint, especially laying passes on the likes of Bourdais and Angelelli. Had to have some fun out there. How's it working for you? Yeah, like you said, uh, made some good passes early on and, and got to the lead and led a little bit here at the Sebring 12 hours. So really thrilled about that. Um, you know, I'm having a lot of fun out there, a lot of passing. There's so many cars, so you're passing at least like five guys a lap. And, um, you know, I always just want, I want to stay out there. If I, if I didn't have to share the car, I'd just stay out there. But, uh, you know, I got two really great teammates and, um, you know, I think the O2 Ganassi team can really have a good shot at winning this thing. You were running hard, obviously, you got to survive this race. Uh, at, at some point, did you just sort of settle into things, or are you guys confident you could just push? Yeah, like you said, it's 12 hours, so uh, the main thing is just getting to the finish. Um, I got a flat tire right at the end there, right when I pitted, so that was perfect timing. Thank God it didn't happen a little earlier, but yeah, this is all about reliability and being there at the end. Um, you know, I, I started to settle into a little groove there once the tires were starting to get worn out, and I was in third. I didn't really push too much, but, um, you know, the car balance right now is pretty good. Uh, we can make some changes to make it a little bit better, but as of now, things are all good. 
uh, certainly running well and even seems like luck is going their way on a day when tire failures and, or, or cut downs and the like are hitting teams at awfully inappropriate times. Well, luck is a big part of success after all. I remember Mike Hull talking about this kid, Karam, who went to Daytona for the Rolex 24 back in January, had never shared a car, never driven an endurance race, never driven with a roof over his head, never driven at night. Look where he is now. Yeah, thing, very impressive. One thing about it, he's not afraid to push the pedal. Right? He's no. not afraid to hammer down. You saw that. I mean, it's easier to slow him down than speed him up. Yeah, that's fact. <laughs> that's true. Jordan Taylor in the 10. Two of Simon Pagano. Two prototype classes. I mean, the, the, they really look pretty much. Oh, uh -oh got one somebody turned around. around. Yeah. Oh, here, here we, we go. go. Oh, here we go again. Oh. Oh. Oh, no, you could see that coming. What the that heck crazy. are you guys what thinking? What are these guys thinking today? My gosh. Unbelievable. You just wow. hope that everyone's okay, but some of these yeah. drivers are just making absurd decisions here. That was just not right. What do they think is going to happen? Ten cards took to traffic. the grass there. You can see Jordan Taylor. Here's something scraping, too. So I think they went for a wild ride. Oh, wait, on the left. I don't know what that. Yeah, it's the 08. One of the Judd Lodzi I think it was cars. the 87, wasn't it? I don't know. Caution number eight. Yeah. Well, we are en route to records for yellow flag stoppages. We've already had one red flag, only the fourth time in history that that has happened here at Sebring. Yeah, we're running out of cars, too, two at a time. 87 is the other car involved, Gaston Kirby. And... Uh, you just come. You can't just pull out in the middle of oncoming traffic. Got the visor up anyway. Hey, who's driving? Uh, it looks like Gaston was in the car. Oh boy, that was another wicked impact. The leader at the time, Alex Tagliani, in LNPC, was involved there and over to our screen left. Hopefully he's okay. Yeah, we haven't looked at that car that much. Yeah, he's, it's high speed there. I mean, you yeah, know, it's to really make quick. these sort of decisions, it is really, really dangerous. I mean, I think some of these guys who have been involved in these sort of incidents today, they really need to look long and hard whether they should be, you know, invited back or sat down for a spell because this is this is crazy stuff that corner is 90 plus mile per hour in one of these prototypes i mean you're at the upper end of third gear that's great tag's a good friend of all of ours and yeah. uh, that could have been a nasty one he's a little shaken up by this yeah he's holding his hand yes. like he may have wrenched yeah. his wrist there Favoring on the steering. His wrist, yeah very common when drivers are gripping a steering wheel when they have a nose in impact well, you, the problem with that was you wouldn't see it coming. You know, you wouldn't have time to to brace for it or anything. It's literally, it's in your face. Well, I'm with you, Calvin. I think somebody needs to yeah, give a general refresher course up and down the pit lane. Normally, drivers are told not to re-enter until they get a signal from a corner worker that the coast is clear. But I think the adrenaline is just flying for some of these guys, and they just, OK, I've made a mistake, and they just right. panic and just want to get back on with it. I mean, you just got to Can't wait to get going down. again. Yeah. So both drivers are out of their cars. Gaston looks OK. I know it's tough. I mean, a lot of these guys don't have the experience of many of the, the pros in this field, but, you know, you just can't be He thought he could get it spun around, but he actually spun farther yeah, too than far. he, he went to yeah. and wound up perpendicular but to the oncoming traffic. Now, looping again. it around, you basically carry no speed. You're not getting out of the way quickly right. on a high speed corner. I mean, yeah. it's just a bad decision. That's a show to you. See the 10 car far left. He went through the field there, right. Jordan Taylor. See wheels flying. I mean, boy, oh boy, where do you go in real time? Oh, oh Tagli had it tried to turn it so he didn't go head in, so it clouded his left side, and that would have probably won. Yeah, yanked the wheel. Yeah. Yanked the wheel and got the wrist injury. Mm -hmm. There's the original spin. Just Traffic stop, just through. stop right there. Just yeah. slow just down. Wait. Just yeah. 
He's got a corner worker to his left here. He's got his back to him, too, so he wasn't getting to see. Oh, man. I didn't see a flag out there either. No. There goes the 10 yeah. through the grass, filling up the smart decision. Hopefully, yeah, he had no damage screen. to the front of the He tank. didn't have any choice there. Look way up. Second car in front of Simon, who we're on board with. Watch ahead right there. That's Tagliani. Clouds yeah. him. He definitely tried to go right to avoid him, but. Wow. So our eighth caution and third, at least third, big wreck brings us once again under the yellow flag. Six minutes away from the halfway point of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Stay with us. Full course caution flies for the eighth time at Sebring International Raceway. Welcome back, everyone. Brian Till, Tommy Kendall, Justin Bell with you back in the booth while the other boys take a break. And Greg Kramer, Darren Law still down in pit lane. I, I'm looking at this incident that's being cleaned up. It takes me back to Matteo Malicelli's crash in turn one. Some near misses that we've seen today with cars re-entering the racetrack when they shouldn't have. And I look at this one. What are you thinking? I mean, it's, I mean, he's not clearly. I mean, it, it reminds me of watch. If you have a three-year-old and you're, you're like, they don't know any better. This, this is accidents happen. That is senseless. That should not happen. I mean, look, we look from the uh, clearly Patron car as he comes through the P2 car, and look at that. It's chaos all over the place. Here, here's, here's my thought on it, and I'm gonna throw a little theory out there. You know, when we all started racing and we, we, we look at that, he spins and you could see he really tried to take avoiding action and got the car sideways and that probably saved a little bit of personal injury on his behalf. But here's, here's a little, I'm gonna throw this out guys. We used to depend very heavily on flag marshals. We used to, we weren't allowed to move back on track without the flag marshal pointing you back on. But in an era of cameras and everything digital, I'm not sure the modern generation of driver look for the flag marshals and respect and look at them. We weren't allowed back on track, right? At Daytona, we do the bus stop, right? You're not allowed to rejoin track. We've never seen an accident there, I don't think in 10 years because of that very rule. Should you be allowed to rejoin the racetrack without the marshals waving you on, especially when you're pointing backwards at turn 16, which is one of the faster corners on the track well if you either back up a ways until the people coming around the corner have some sight lines or if he pulled forward counter course the wall would reveal and he'd be able to look back up the track because there's a curb there uh, that you can look through that corner tag did an amazing tag almost missed him anyways even with that happening well, what what's shocking to me and and i guess what's disappointing to me is this is supposed to be fun. It is. It's entertaining. It's all of that for the competitors, both pro and amateur alike. But the fact of the matter is there is a risk involved in this. There is huge risk involved in this. And there's risk enough in driving the car quickly. But when others put you at even greater risk, um, it, it's disappointing to see. Let's check in with Darren Law. Hey, guys. You know, we've all been racing a long time, and I am just, I'm, I'm completely floored at the bad decisions these guys are making. And I am honestly, seriously, I am going to walk down pit lane here, and you guys know I'm involved with the Bond Round School. I'm going to hand them a, a, my business card to come to the driving school. This is crazy. Well, the discussion's been going on already. In fact, hey, guys, in fact, I just saw Jim France, and he said, why don't you give them your card? <laughs> well, there you go. Wow. Uh, that would be funny if there wasn't so darn yeah. much carnage here. Well, you know, and you, it's like I said, there's risk involved. You don't have to make it worse. The fact of the matter is motorsports has a risk involved. And you can't put people in jeopardy and in danger by moves like that. And that's exactly what happened. Greg? Well, I think a guy named Paul Genelosi would agree with you guys completely, obviously. Uh, things looking so good for both cars, and then we hear about this. I come down here, your head's in your hands. Uh, a tough, tough moment. Lucky that tag is okay, it looks like. Well, the most important thing is that Alex is okay. He's got a little cut in his hand from what we could see on the video. He was in the car a long time, didn't answer, of course. That gave us great anxiety. Um, so we're now sure Alex is, in the most part, physically good. Um, I can't say much for the other driver. I, uh, he was out of the car. I'm sure he needs to go get uh, an EKG or something to make sure he's still got a brain because somebody with a brain probably wouldn't have done that. 
Uh, there's no reason for it. It was just irresponsible. Um, we come to Sebring, for me, since 1980. You know there's a, a lot of guys of varying talents, but you're risking your life out there. And the last thing you need is somebody to make just an irresponsible move. Yeah, it was a great piece of driving by Tag to minimize it as much as it did. On the other side, things still looking okay for you with the 09. Oh, yeah. The, the 09 car is in great shape. The, the fluxation of the pit stop strategy put us in the lead. They're just as fast. I, I know the Braun car is really fast. So we'll be there at the end unless we get another one of these. Well, let's hope we don't. And by the way, guys, I thank you very much. You're absolutely right on the corner marshals. As one who still loves to do that, when you get, let the corner marshal give you a point and a release, you don't have this stuff. Well, we just dropped inside the six hour mark. That means we've crossed the halfway mark. So let's take a look at the SRT halfway leader from here at Sebring. I mean, it has been a wild one to say the least. It's Ryan Dial, who is our SRT halfway leader. And interesting because Ryan drove. He was my SRT, SRT teammate yeah, I was last say, year. Last year, <laughs> behind the wheel now of an Extreme Speed Motorsports prototype, and we should say Alex Tagliani had just taken the lead in the prototype challenge category when that happened. So, and and Paul Genalozzi said it in a little harsher way than I did. I said it about taking risk. He said we're we're putting our lives in our hands out here because the fact of the matter is motorsports is still dangerous and you can still lose your life and you don't need anybody to help you along with with that and. And if, you, if, if we see a replay of that again, you'll see, and Greg Kramer talked about it, there is a corner worker clearly standing behind the wall looking up the racetrack to see if there are cars coming. Look to the left. You see him with the headset on. He's looking back that way. He doesn't even know that the car's pulled back on track yet. He's waiting to find a hole, and then he's going to tell the guy to go. Yeah, I mean, these guys, I mean, Greg brought it up. I mean, the, the marshals are incredible. There you are. You can see the flag guy. He's, well, he's just on the right of the screen. Um, that could have had horrible consequences. But, you know, the flag marshals, all volunteers, uh, very experienced for the main part, especially when you're, it's, it's a hierarchy to this, guys. You know, you, you don't start out working Sebring 12 hour when you're a rookie right. flag marshal. These guys have normally been around a long time. And, you know, one guy that knows it and he volunteers a ton, and I think it's probably why he's such a good announcer. But, Greg, would you, if you'd been standing there, felt that it was your responsibility to help that guy be released back onto track? Well, absolutely. There's a protocol on the corner. And when you get to the point where you've got the license grade to be working in an event like this, there's a protocol on the corner. And obviously, when you've got long corners, you'll have workers at different stations. So you have workers spaced that will tell you what traffic is coming. And they're literally giving you an indication to the person with the orange glove that they're supposed to look for, at least in the old days, with a very obvious orange glove that helps you with the release. And they get a hole in traffic, and then they let you go and the most frustrating thing from a corner workers perspective is when you're going through that whole deal and it's not clear and it's clear it isn't and the guy just leaves that's there there's really no need for it we work very hard on on the corners and they train to do exactly that initiate a safe release well and you see that with the corner worker there with the orange gloves all of these corner workers are volunteers they're here because they want to be. They're here because they love the sport, and they do a good job. We couldn't race without them. But I think, too, from a driver's standpoint, a lot of these guys relying way too much on technology, sitting comfy in the car because they got a radio that they can talk to their crew guys and all of that other kind of stuff. But your crew guy's not standing on the corner looking up the racetrack, seeing what's coming. Your crew guy can't tell you that it's clear that your life will be okay if you pull back on track and that you're not going to put anyone else in danger. And we've got to go back to that basic regional driving experience and learn to trust the corner workers that are there because every one of those guys, just like we're looking at, is there because they love the sport and they're trying to help us as drivers be safe. Yeah, it'll be very interesting, actually. Uh, I mean, Paul Walters, you know, who is the official here, the, the main guy for, for the series, um, it's... I, I, I think everyone will support him wholeheartedly in any decisions he makes. I mean, in, like I said before, you make a bad call in soccer, you, you foul someone, you get a yellow card, you do it twice, you're kind of out for a while. And I think that should be a place in, in, this is professional racing. So Paul will get a lot of support from all of us, especially up here in the booth. And, uh, but you know, he gives everyone an amazing driver's briefing. <laughs> and in the end, it is still the human factor yep. that is the flaw. It's not, uh, he tells everyone how it's supposed to be played. The game has rules and, uh, they don't always follow them. Well, the discussion's been going on all weekend about the level of driving 
And uh, during my time off air, I went and talked to some folks, and I talked. He asked not to be named. I, I didn't know I'd be saying it in this context. He asked not to be named. A, one of the winningest guys in the series said he has never seen the level of driving poorer than this weekend. And in the past, when you were fighting for car count and so forth, you know, we've been we've been singing this tune for a long time because there's there's always been guys that you complain about. But um, and, and, and the amateurs, the inexperienced guys don't have a monopoly on it. Uh, you know, Malicelli did something yeah. almost you know, virtually as bad. But um, but I think there's going to be a discussion to it used to be, well, we need the cars. So even though the guy's iffy, we're not going to send him home. The person that caused that accident, Gaston, his entire pro resume consists of his first race was at the Rolex. And uh, so experience clearly uh, an issue to look at. Now, like I said, uh, the inexperienced don't have a monopoly on the on the poor decisions apparently today. But um, I, I suspect he's going to have a, a fight on his hands um, coming back. But let's look at the positive, which is there's still an amazing race going on, and and these incidents are happening. But meanwhile, the strategy is taking place. It's just been everything keeps getting reset. We've talked about a lack of rhythm in this particular race because of the number of yellows. When I was down with same place you were, talk, I was at, uh, having some lunch, talking to the drivers and some of the team managers, and they're like, "We need, you know, we need this race to go greener, so so actually it can start to unfold as it should." What is going on here with the nine? It looks like it's taking a long, long time on the stop. Are they taking? They've put a new nose they put on. A nose, they just changed the nose. Yes, yeah. a long time. But this is when you want to do changes like yeah. that. This yeah. is when you take the opportunity to get them done under full course caution. Yeah, you're going to lose some positions, but not nearly what you would lose. You see the damage up on the right front where it's not fitting very well. Yeah, and I think this is a uh, this is a result of where he got into the back of Memo Rojas when Fogarty, who was in the car before, got in the back of Memo Rojas. And we saw the dive plane or something come up. Yeah. Here's a look at the 31 Whelan Corvette, Greg. Yeah, they were just in, did a stop. It was a little bit longer. It wasn't a standard stop. They actually went into the front end of the car, took the Packers out. They were looking to tweak the handling a little bit. So after that moment when the entire electronic dash display fell down early in the race and they tried to fix it and pit lane had to take it behind the wall, since it's come back, they said this car is working. We want to make it work a little better. Obviously, they're down a bit, but this is a great opportunity to do uh, essentially a glorified test session and maybe get up there just a little bit the way this race is unfolding. Packers. Uh, packers are basically uh, meant to limit the travel. You can either run a higher spring rate or higher um, ride height to keep the car up, but what that, that affects your efficiency. So what they do is they put these shims inside the shock, and when it comes down, it, it'll hit that hard, and it won't, uh, won't allow it to go any lower. But if you're getting into those Packers other than on the straightaway, and I heard Marino Franchitti, I believe he was on the PA talking about it. the difference between the P2 car and the DP. The P2 car has what's called a third spring which uh, allows you to still run softer springs for grip in the slower corners, but it, it adds uh, up and down stiffness so you, you can keep the car off the ground in the straightaway when the downforce builds up higher and higher. What about right now? Thanks for that very nice explanation. You notice I asked Tommy about it, not you. Well, my I would have used a <laughs> thousand words instead of a hundred because I always find that's more appropriate. Um, I just felt that bus run over my head. Thanks, you, Brian. Uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, it's quite hot right now. The afternoon sun is, is there. These cars don't like going slow so much. They certainly don't like being in traffic, but it's the drivers right now that are probably going to be feeling a little bit more of the temperature. Maybe the guys down there can tell us what the track and ambient temperature is, but it's uh, sometimes if your car has a nice cooling system, you've got nice, you know, nice uh, cool suit and a lot of cold drink, you don't mind a yellow flag if you've been in for a while. The reverse of that is that if you've got none of that, you've run out of everything. A yellow flag uh, sitting behind the pace car is really quite painful. Um, so I imagine we've got a spread of those emotions out there right now. Well, one of the greatest developments in racing for drivers came when the FI, the cockpit temperatures were going up and up and up. So the uh, ACO said they mandated maximum cockpit temperatures. So all the cars that came from ALMS have pretty sporty air conditioning systems. The DPs. They, they, they try to keep the guys cool, but it wasn't mandated. You would literally get pulled off the track at Le Mans if your cockpit temperature got too hot. So well, I, I was, and I, I emphasis on dummy, I was the crash test dummy for you a decade before in the Viper. The record temperature was 168 degrees in Japan. When I jumped out for the pit stop, well, jump out, more crawled out, I, I wondered why my feet felt strange. I'd left my 
my brake, you know, my right foot was still on the brake pedal. It just melted. The, they had to like scrape my shoe off and I jumped out without it. And everyone was passing out, taking IVs and 168 degrees in the car. I lost eight pounds in, in two hours, which apparently well, I need is to get better than Jenny Quick. Brian, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> You know, what these guys really want to do is race. We've spent almost three and a half hours, well, three and a half hours now with this caution behind the safety car. And some of the reasons why, well, it started at the very beginning of the race, just shortly after we went green, a few minutes in, not even an hour in, when Ben Keating had a problem, fire in his GT Daytona Viper, it caught on fire. And then a big one down in turn one. Yeah, that was a really, that was a driver error followed by driver error caused, uh, uh, could have been a far worse chain reaction. And this was nasty. Scary looking. 38, the performance tech prototype challenge car into the wall at 17. That was bad enough, but then was collected by the car oh, geez, from Bayshore. And then this last one, Alex Tagliani, great reactions to get the car sideways a little bit before contact and didn't just spear Gaston Kirby, so. Yeah, okay, here's a little uh, quiz to see if our viewers were watching. How many of those were avoidable accidents? <laughs> there was nearly every one. Well, that yeah. was just very, I mean, I think this is something about the closeness of the competition as well. It's rather like in NASCAR or in strict plate racing when something goes wrong, one car goes, these cars are running so close, something goes wrong in front of you, you, you become partner to that. Well, we saw a lot of cars make pit stops, uh, the prototypes, when the pit lane was open just moments ago. Number 10 was one of them, and uh, Jordan Taylor climbed out. He's with Darren. Hey, I'm here with Jordan Taylor. Jordan, you guys, you've had a fast car, you've had some ups and downs, and then obviously on that last incident back there, you had to drive off the track, and we saw a lot of lot of grass in the radiator. That caused an issue with heat or anything? Yeah, it did, and we had to come in under the yellow when the close, pits were closed, but I think we were allowed to because I saw we went off. but. I mean, it's a bit frustrating. Same exact thing as a 24-hour, someone going off in front of us and us having to avoid it. But that's part of racing and still a long way to go. Still a long way to go. On strategy-wise, are you guys good? Are you back in the hunt? Yeah, well, that just kind of messed us up right there. We were back in the hunt, leaving on that lap. We were back right behind the O2, ahead of Pagano. So we were in a good place. And then another unfortunate event. But I mean, these guys are the best. So they'll, they'll get a look over the car this next stop, and we'll be back out there. Yeah, like you said, a long way to go. I got to ask, that mullet, it's its really getting big. Are you going to keep that thing for much longer? I want to make it through Le Mans and then, you know, do some sort of charity event, uh, cut it off and see how much we can raise for charity. All right, yeah, it's, it's definitely not aerodynamic. It's blocking a lot of stuff and gross. I just got sweat all over me. <laughs> Back to you guys. <laughs> the, the power of the mullet. Jordan rocking the mullet. He's also known as Hair Jordan. Uh, very the, funny. Yeah, That's quite I, a good I'm one. Just, I'm, I'm just relaying the information. I I'm, didn't... I'm just thinking to myself, does does he look like a young Wayne Taylor or does Wayne look like an old Jordan Taylor? <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, uh, anyone that's been well, a fan of there, there you are. No, definitely he's a young version. Yeah. There you are, Wayne Taylor. It was so great watching him racing. I remember we saw the little, the, them as little boys running around, some great photographs that Daytona was circulating. I don't even know how he deals with team managing his own son, but when I saw him outside he uh, on Friday, he was like, I said, Wayne, it, you must be the only guy that's glad not to be in a car. And he goes, you know, Justin, I'm so happy not to be in a racing car. There were a couple of other words in there. But he is just <laughs> absolutely overjoyed not to be racing. Uh, the 55 BMW has just had... Well, the team has had oh. problems, and the 55 has that damage. He's been carrying it for a while. They've actually been running well. They, came, they were the leaders as they came in, but it's not been smooth sailing for them. They've had that damage to the right front now for quite some time. The 56 has really been the BMW that has suffered the most today. Look at this, Brian. Isn't that interesting how close the steering wheel is to the drivers in that BMW? That's... Uh, and high. And look high. At it. It's, it's going to drop line. down. It's going to drop down. They'll tilt it. it. They'll tilt it. Okay. But, you know, and for the folks at home, the, the, the cars are adjustable. I mean, some of the cars now have tilt steering wheels and stuff, and you can move them. And it really depends on what you like. I was talking to somebody earlier. I liked a high steering wheel. Yeah. And you'll watch other drivers. They like them down a little bit lower. Yeah. I, well, that was always my fight with Kuno and Jonathan last year is I always needed a high for some clearance on my legs, and they, it would start to get into their sight line. So, we, you know, we literally we'd sneak it up quarter an inch. He, he did not lower the steering wheel. So, yeah. you see, his eye line goes just over the top, and that's kind of personal preference. 
Um, I, I used to like to sit as low as I could so I could barely see over. When you have to deal with other drivers, you have to compromise. I, I did do go do a little bit of uh, a reconnaissance. You know, we, we finally realized that the, the team car did not sustain that damage in the main incident. And so I went and talked to John Edwards, and he said actually he was slowing down for the incident and got drilled from behind by the factory Porsche. So the factory Porsche has been doing a lot of, uh, it's been the hammer, and yeah. uh, the Corvette was its nail. And yep. so in, it, he thinks it might have turned it and he hit the turn inside wall in turn one, which did the left front damage, but it actually came from a collision at the back. He slowed down for the incident, and the Porsche did not get it slowed down. When they had a tweet a little while ago, Team RLL, and we were talking about an upright issue on the on the 56. So, you know, once you get involved with it, and Justin pointed that out very early in the program, once you get involved in some of these incidents, the true damage may not be seen for quite a while. So take a look. We were talking about driver preference. It's the 45 on the left. That is one of the Audis from Flying Lizard Motorsports. And then the 55 on the right, the BMW. And you can see a very different different setup in the car. Yeah, it looks like, Tommy, you should have been hired for Audi, actually, because there's more <laughs> space in that one. Unless, of course, he's five foot three. But I think it is. The Audi also, the dynamics of the cockpit is different from that Z4. Z4 is much higher up in, in general. It just has that sort of uh, cockpit environment. Well, and don't forget, it's not what just you like. You had a really valid point, Tommy, and that's the thing about sports car racing. Sage Karam talked about it, and I know the guys were talking about Sage earlier, sharing a car. You don't get to pick what just you want, and that's why some of these GT cars now, it's nice that they finally have evolved into some type of a tilt steering wheel, because back in the day when everything's fixed, or in some of the cars where it still is fixed, well, you, gotta, you gotta arrive at a compromise. And there's some, some guys that really aren't that particular, and some guys are extremely particular, and depending on where your pecking order is, I was talking to Graham Rahal, I know he's watching and listening, so hey Graham, um, who drove that car, and he basically said at Daytona, he said, listen, anytime I thing I ask for, Jorg does not want to hear it. He said, you're driving it like it is, basically. Yeah. And that was the same when I drove with Paul Newman at Daytona. Uh, he was paying all the freight, and Roush told me, I said, hey, I, my, my knees are rubbing on my legs. He goes, well, do we need to get another guy? I said, no, no, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. So <laughs> yeah. uh, Paul likes it. <laughs> yeah, Paul was comfortable. Yeah, Paul I mean, it. I, it was the same when I did the, the World Championship for Viper. There was a moment that I drove with a little European guy who, who one, set, one stint, I think he stayed in the car with me, <laughs> sat on my lap. Anyway, look, they're taking the green again. Let's have some clean racing, everybody. Two very different power plants up front right now. Ryan DL leads the feed, field to green right behind him, the Daytona prototype, the number five of Christian Fittipaldi. I'll tell you what, Dio with a good jump on the start. Well, this is gonna be interesting because we saw the speed of those two cars was really, really similar, but traffic affected Ryan much more disproportionately because like we said, where he's generating the lap time. I'm pretty sure, and I, I talked to him yesterday, he said, if we're out front, I'm pretty sure I can stay out front, but passing is difficult. Now, uh, if they get into traffic and Fittipaldi is able to stay close and he gets held up, he can get around it. But this will be an interesting watch with the rolls flipped. And uh, Dial was, uh, it was neat to watch he and uh, Bourdais going at it. They both ran the fastest laps of the race on the same lap chasing each other. And Dial is a guy that's kind of under the radar, but if you watch him, when he was in uh, when he was in the Star Wars car, he is always going forward. Under, I mean, he's highly rated, but underrated in my view. We and just saw Brundle go past Tony Kanaan, and now Tony didn't like that Tony very much because he like has gone straight back. But of course, we're seeing Mar uh, Marino right behind in the O1 car. He's looking for an opportunity. This is great. This is road racing right now. Good, good stuff. And as you said, it's where they make their lap time. You think of the. Open top prototype, the P2 car, is a little bit more of a momentum car. You ride on board the 01 right now, the Ford Power in the back, and now on board the two, Simon Pagano, who is right behind Marino Franchitti. Now, uh, for our viewers, just coming up is the right hand where we just had that last accident. So you see the speed they go through here and how they're unsighted? That's why that was quite such a big crash. It's the first time we've really ridden through there for a while. And now we're going down back straight. Can you see the DP pulling away? Let's see if he gains under braking into turn 17. The mid corner speed should be faster under the bridge. Look at that, under braking, big time. Nothing he can do with that nope. move right there. Nope. It, basically, a slower car will check your speed, whereas there's very little that's going to check the speed of the DP on the straightaway. Well, I think that that's the issue. If you're driving a Daytona prototype, you not only have to understand your car, you have to understand the P2 car. If you get one right behind you, if you can balk him at the apex and delay his throttle application, delay that momentum through the corner, you're going to be better off. Yeah, it did look like he parked it a bit in the middle of the yeah. corner and then got the whole shot. So. 
on board the 93, the SRT Viper. Oh, look at the traffic back behind. Yeah, he's leading for now. That's Rob Bell leading in the 93, but look at that Corvette. The age-old Viper vet battle heats up. Garcia, Long, Gavin, it's, it's, it's all happening in that. Wow, what a scrum. What fantastic. And of course, this is a set out corner, isn't it, Tommy? You're really concentrating on traction coming out of there as you go through this rather smooth part of the track down into a very tight hairpin. It is one that you can really make a late breaking move, but you've also got to exit it because you'll otherwise just get overtaken, just like we saw uh, with Brundle and Kanan a minute ago. So they're keeping themselves clean as they turn in there. Oh, and but it's Garcia in the yellow Corvette, the first of the Corvettes that you see there who's putting the pressure on the back of Rob Bell and the traffic in front of Bell is not helping this at all. The 63 in front of him is Kyle Marcelli, who's running fourth in the GTD category. So he didn't want to just give it up. He he's trying to chase down the white Porsche in front, who is Lee Keen. But right now he's got the battle for GT Le Mans right behind him. And this is the perfect uh, showcase of the difficulty with the straightaway speed of the GTD cars. And we, lap time wise, the GT Le Mans cars are quite a bit quicker. Oh, there's another. Those PC cars really having trouble with uh, with tire temp and grip. Do all not around. join the track, Heath. Let's hope, he, thankfully, the whole field was bunched up enough. He was able to get stuck the other side. Uh, so, but now he's going to have to Don't uh, back up. <laughs> do not back up. But this battle up here is so nice. I mean, let's see if the Corvette, as he comes down onto the back straight, can do anything about the Viper in front. He did have to acquiesce a little bit there for the Wayne Taylor car. Well, what you notice Rob doing both in the hairpin and the next corner, he was held up behind the GTD car, so he was basically choosing the inside, not necessarily because he was trying to get by the GTD car, but you know, to protect himself until he could get through. And you saw Garcia, if he was on the inside, he was always looking to the outside. Um, I, I caught up, well, here we have the battle also, the four car, Oliver Gavin. Just out of the side of your picture, or flashing through past the right edge of your picture was a change for the lead, I believe, in GT Daytona. So we've got good battles all around the racetrack in the different classes. That's the fight there. Viper versus Corvette and for the Viper lead in GTLM. Porsche for third. And yes, that black Ferrari, the 555 of Townsend Bell has gotten past Madison Snow. Good stuff in both of the GT classes and a problem for the 49. Thankfully, he rejoined on the outside of, of that little hairpin there. But uh, look at them. They are a look freight train going down there. This is this is solid racing right now. The Viper, of course, has to not Ryan. become the bumping part of that sandwich, but nice exit there. Ryan hunter Ray in the silver 91 Viper just in front of Andy Prio in the 55 BMW. And then behind Andy Prio, the 56. Rio in the black BMW, the 55, running six right now. They were just on the pits a little while ago. You ride on board the 93, Rob Bell, your leader in GTLM. And right in front of him, you see Lee Keen in the 22, that white Porsche. And just in front of Keen is Madison Snow. So the three cars in front of Rob Bell are first, second, and third in class. Yeah, they got their own battle on right now, haven't they? That's interesting inside move there. But you just want a nice clean exit and of course, the Lee, Lee Keen, as he's sitting there right up behind Townsend and Madison, I mean, he's got his... That battle for GTD, we know there's so many points on the line. There's, there's all sorts of implications for points in, the, oh, in this longer that. race, but... Squeezed through to take the lead. Garcia. Using that GTD car as a pick. I think he got the better run onto the back straightaway, and Garcia goes to the lead. Let's check in in the Corvette camp with Greg. Well, the fact that that car just went to the lead and Danny Binks on the radio here watching him down into turn one. And that team, certainly, you've got great drivers, but in the lead after what happened early, that's insane. It's down to an amazing crew, isn't it, Dan? It's unbelievable. You know, we changed the whole front end of that car. Everybody dug hard. We practiced that stuff at the shop. All the repairs are awesome, and now we just took the lead. Unbelievable. These guys at Corvette Racing are unbelievable. Yeah, to get it done as quick as you did and then have the car working as well as you did. But that's something that this team, as you said, you prepare for the unknown, and that's one of our big storylines today. Well, we do prepare for that. We just do the job right, no matter how long it takes, get it done right, 
and then we can race later. And now, you know, we were lap down, we're on the lead lap, just took the lead, we're awesome. And you got a guy like Antonio Garcia that uses those groups in front as a pick and goes to the point. This is amazing. Well, Greg, talking about using traffic, and I think Townsend Bell was trying to use a little bit of Corvette traffic. He wanted to let the Corvette through relatively cleanly so he could perhaps get a car between himself and Madison Snow back behind him. Right on board the four. Also, as the four went past Townsend there, he knows Townsend's in that car. He knows there's a good driver in it. That's why he was able to go slide by without impeding either of them. I'll tell you who jumped forward was Patrick Long in the 912 Porsche. He's now in second running in the serial. It's Garcia, then Long in that Porsche, Ali Gavin. Where did that Rob Bell go? That All night. three got all around that Rob yeah. on, that, on that lap, so, uh, and he's fallen back. So whether he's got a problem. Just coming onto the straightaway, so they've pulled out significantly. Looked like the hood might have been up on that, uh, on the Viper, the leading edge of the hood. Right on board, the 22. Lee Keen for Alex Job Racing. His team won here last year. Cooper McNeil would love another victory, so would Alex Job. 25 years of sports car racing, 25 years of Sebring, Alex Job is done with the start this year, and man, Lee Keen all over the back of Madison Snow. I feel like perhaps the handling going away a bit in that 13 Rum Bum Porsche. That was a solid move to go down yeah, the inside there strong. and equal cars because, I mean, he really st stuck it in there quite positively. And of course, now he's leading up, but he's got the Falcon Porsche sliding, weaving his way through as well. That's that's just the break that he actually needed right there to, uh, to get a little bit more space between him and the car he just overtook. I'll tell you what's impressive is Team Falcon Tire, brand new car. They've had very little testing on it. We've all talked to the drivers down there and said, we don't really know what we've got. This is a tire from last year. It's the tire they won Petit Le Mans on. They said, we don't really know how it's going to work with this new chassis. We haven't had time to develop a new one, but this team has run strong here for the last couple of years. They had a good finish here last year on the podium. And one more time, maybe they want to run here at Sebring for an entire, do an entire championship run here because this car always seems to run well at this racetrack, but he's got his mirrors full right now. We talked about 25 years, and it's not just 25 years of showing up. They're going, Alex Job Racing is going for its 10th class win in 25 years. Impressive stuff. Look at that Look at bump. bumps. Ooh. Tell you too, in the beginning, I, I watched the 01 car over the bumps. There's the five. I watched the 01 car over the bumps. I didn't feel like the car had a very good shock package on it. It seemed to have a lot of movement to it. I thought the 02 was a little bit better, but it looks like the 01 has come a little bit better throughout the, the, the race. I don't know if they've been able to make some changes to the car during some of these long cautions when they came in for stops or what, but it seems like perhaps the racetrack coming to them a bit. Not much separating them. You can tell these cars, this is the rhythm we're talking about. The race is now settled down quite nicely. These. I hope that wasn't a kiss of death. Yeah. Um, but you know, watching Marino here, he's able to take stock of the car in front. I mean, these cars, they are working at it. I mean, if we could see their hands right now, you'd, you'd see how much they're having to work that wheel because this DP around this track with these bumps, as you said earlier, Tommy, it's new territory for these guys. They've, they haven't hit bumps like this. I don't know. They haven't hit <laughs> bumps like this. I ever. mean, they're an order of magnitude higher on downforce. They're in a whole yeah. different level of downforce with the cars, so even though it's an overall kind of a proven platform, um, there's a lot of variables. Obviously, they're dealing with the Ford EcoBoost, which uh, cars run in second and fourth. So, and to show you the confidence of Ganassi, they put all their race stuff in on Thursday night. They, they skipped warm up this morning, so they did, they tested, leak checks, did all that stuff yesterday, and so the guys got to sleep in until the engines fired and uh, woke them up, but uh, they were not taking part in warm up this morning. Down into turn 17, and this is a long, fast entry into this corner. The downforce changes, as you were talking about, Tommy, to the Daytona prototype have been substantial. And it's one of the things that every driver at Daytona prototype had a big smile on their face when they first tested that aero package, because nothing a driver likes better than downforce. Yeah, I mean, it makes, oh, horsepower. It makes everything yeah. better. <laughs> well, they kind of got a bit more of all that. They, yeah, they, uh, they, they Downforce, did. horsepower, and better brakes. In fact, those are the three areas that we all like. Uh, but, you know, you, you only have to see the, 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 the effort that teams have gone into to, this is, to bring their cars up to racing speed with the new technologies and to get them equal with that BOP. What I love about it is, you know, you talk to the engineers, they have, 
it's a challenge. They've all risen to the challenge on both sides of the fence here, which is why we're getting such a good race up at the front. Simon Pagano hanging on up at the front. We ride on board with him right now. He's running fifth, and you can tell that that ebb and flow between the two cars in front of him, it stays pretty consistent. Pagano, wish we could see his hands just a little bit better. He is typically so incredibly smooth with the inputs to these cars. He spent a lot of time driving prototypes. He understands them very well. And, and that is one of the things that every driver who's ever driven a P2-based car has said is momentum, momentum, momentum. You got to keep that up. That means you got to be smooth with your hands, really roll the car smoothly into the corners. And Pagano is just a magician at that. Well, the unification and the level of driving at any point, you look at the leader of the board in all these classes and it just goes, the, the talent, Dial, Canon, Fittipaldi, Franchitti, Pagano, Brundle, that's one class, another class, Garcia, Gavin, Patrick Long, Bell, Hensler, Hunter Ray, and any driver of, of these top cars, it's just stacked. It's like it's 60 some cars. We've talked that not all the cars are uh, at, at the same level, but uh, the greatest collection of sports car drivers in one place uh, that you could ask for. A little bit of frustration there trying to get past the 23. You saw Simon Pagano. I don't think he was waving, saying, have a nice day. Well, like he was saying, it's not 100% Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a very good French accent, but whatever. No, not really, no. <laughs> oh, oh well, I thought it was Lebanese. Sorry, I didn't, quite, I didn't quite get that. From the man who thought a packer was the guy at the hotel that put your clothes in the suitcase. I heard a really good joke about that that Chip Ganassi told me yesterday not to be repeated. Yeah, we probably break. shouldn't talk about that right now. Corvettes. Two glorious yellow Corvettes as they come through. One, two as they come through. I mean, Corvette works so hard. Daytona was a rough yeah. week, for the, week for them, but here they are at the front leading their class. Corvette racing nine wins here at Sebring since 2002. Can they get another one in class? We'll have to find out. More coming your way from the 60-second running of the Mobile One, 12 hours of Sebring. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back to Florida. Back at Sebring, you ride on board the number four Corvette in the GTLM category. Running second right now, teammate Antonio Garcia out in front in the three. And wow, things really beginning to tighten up. Simon Pagano really beginning to put pressure on Marino Franchitti in the 0-1 from Chip Ganassi Racing just in front. Honda Power versus Ford Power. P2 based machine there in the hands of Pagano and right behind him you can look back and see Alex Brundle in the 42 and Brundle has been hanging on to the back of that pack for a while he kind of put himself in the middle of it and it's almost like he can run the pace part of me thinks he's willing to run there right now and just kind of hang and cruise and another part of me says well he's a pretty good race car driver he doesn't want to hang there and cruise he wants to move forward if he could yeah, um, I, I think he's, he's probably not exactly you know, holding back. Uh, so we'll have to see. It's funny, I met Alex Brown. I'm not sure you would remember this, but I rode to Silverstone with Martin when Martin was racing in F1. And uh, Alex was about eight years old. My wife still talks about this. He was so composed and the, spoke in that great English accent. He says, you should see our, are you staying where we are? I've got my own telly. <laughs> My wife still, she doesn't know he's grown up and he's turned into a race car driver and now he's here. But uh, he, was a, he was a precocious eight-year-old. So here's the deal. You can do an English accent from now on, but please don't try the French one again. May we. Oui. <laughs> May we oui is exactly what is happening there for Pagano right now. Um, he's, you know, he's able to run right comfortably, but Brundle seems to struggle, in, not him struggle, actually, the car struggles in certain areas on the track. This traffic is going to help him quite a bit close that gap back up. But I, I think it's an ebb and flow on tire right now. You, you, I mean, how long have they been out, do you think, on these tires? Have they been probably quite well into the end of this stint? Well, yeah, the last stop for Brundle looks like it was back on lap 125, and he's done 143 now. So 18 laps in. Marino with a little drop of the wheel there. You know, you talk about patience. That's the other things that, that drivers like Brundle do and Simon Pagano's, the guys who are professionals. The car may not be the best right now. They may not be able to hang on. Yeah, they're giving it all they can, but they're being patient. They're not going to do something desperate. It's not time to be desperate yet. We've got five hours and 24 minutes yet to go. Wait for the next pit stop. 
affect a change if you can, then see what you've got. You know you've got several more stops before the end of the race. You can keep moving forward if you can keep making the car better. And with the number of yellows we've had and you expect to have, you know, you just need to, it's hard to rein yourself in because every time you're in the car, you're trying to move forward. You're competing, uh, you know, for your jobs and so forth. Um, as we see Ryan Dial working around the outside, that basically P2 line that um, I, I also saw the Oak car use it in turn one, the outside. And uh, you better be all the way around before you get out to that exit curb. But um, I think know. that was self-fulfilling the prophecy you told him he was talking about earlier. Yeah. If I'm out front, I can stay there and he just needs to get enough clearance on a DP car to be able to hold it. And uh, he's, he's really cutting through this traffic like with a scythe. Well, I mean, and you talk about that outside move in 17, you need to know that the guy saw you coming down the back straightaway, that you're there, and he sees you all the way through that corner, easy to get pinched up to the outside. And you go back to the Pro-Am classes like GTD and PC, a lot of times for some of those drivers, it's all that they can do to hang on. And you think about 17, your eyes are to the right anyway, trying to find that apex, trying to find the exit visually. And now you got a guy over here in your blind spot to the left trying to go around the outside. Well, and if you're going around the outside, it's a substantial speed difference. And the person in the front car, theoretically, is at the limit as well. And so yep. he's 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 worried about where he's going. So you need to be all the way around so he sees him. And look at, oh, the traffic held up Kanan, but Kanan took two seconds out of the lead there. And so the theme that seems to show up is that the DP-based car seems to get through traffic better. I, I think the, the BOP needs to be where the P2 car is quicker. In, in open air if you want to have a fair fight once you get into traffic on most tracks. So it looks like the speed is about the same now, which means for me it gives, like on restarts and traffic and so forth, gives the nod to the DP when it comes down to the end. We'll see, have to see how it plays out. Also, you'll see Ryan has been in the car an hour and 10 minutes longer than Tony, which is one of the reasons I think he's driving so well at the front because he's been through a lot of carnage and, and got a real feel for what's going on out there. But it also means, you know, Tony's pretty, well, he doesn't need, Tony could do 10 hours in the car and he still look fit and healthy, I think. But it means that, uh, you know, Kanan's got f fresher rubber, fresher him right now. Um, but you wouldn't believe that looking at Ryan Dayal right out the front. It wasn't that many laps ago that the 13 GTD entry of Madison Snow was in the lead. You see that multicolored rum bum entry, but now he has slipped back. He's running in third and Andy Lally all over the back of him in his Magnus Racing Porsche. And in fact, is he going to get it done here? Not yet, but I think the hairpin may be a good bet. Yeah, when you got Lally behind and he's got the bit between his teeth, I think this will be a, a fun move coming down here on the braking, but they have to look out for the oak car. Through the fast sweeper and then heavy, heavy braking into the slowest corner on the racetrack and the Delta Wing isn't going to help Andy Lally out. He's not going to be able to get it because Delta Wing looks up the inside. Yeah, that was that was the opportunity was taken away from Andy there uh, with that much traffic and of huge experience. And uh, he I think he played prudent. Well, I mean, it goes back to with five and a half hours or five hours and 20 minutes remaining in the race. Andy Lally is one of those pros who goes and there's not anybody more aggressive than he is on the racetrack, but he certainly can be patient when he needs to. And I think he was patient at that point in time. Gabby Chavez in the Delta Wing had looked up the inside, and if Andy had moved over, there would have been contact. I have to say, he went through that traffic very well, Gabby did. He he took his time, he paced himself, and he cleared them both. Uh, because he's only, we talk about the differential between the classes, he's only a, a Nats thing whisker. faster, <laughs> the whisker, than, than the other, faster than the, the GTD cars. Right behind Kyle Marcelli. Andy said, yeah. Andy Lally has a mirror full of Kyle Marcelli, and Marcelli's driven everything. He, he's driven Porsches, but he's probably better known for driving the prototype challenge cars, but another one of those young drivers that really is kind of the future of sports car racing. And I think there are a handful of these young drivers who started in open wheel racing and just said, you know what? The chances of me getting a top IndyCar ride five, six years from now are a lot smaller than getting a top sports car ride. I'm playing in a little larger pond here, and I'm going to try to open that opportunity up. And they focused on sports car racing, and it's working for them. This is a really good battle watching these two drive through there. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that would be commitment. 
and uh, or a certain amount of insanity. One of the two. <laughs> Go on. Good stuff. No, no, I. <laughs> Was that was that which car was that was that Pagano or was that, that was, 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 that was Pagano and uh, okay. Frank yeah. That was impressive. Marino probably came around the other side of the car and went, "How did that happen?" Yeah, There's Madison's, no way. Madison is holding off Andy rather well right now, um, but every time we have a faster prototype coming up, it does throw the cat in amongst the pigeons, and he's going to split, go past Andy right now and certainly give Madison a breakthrough here, but the reverse will happen as we come up onto the, the... Actually, this is a big transition here. If we just follow the prototype through, you go through this left-hander, right-hander, you break very heavily, and here's where the new road sort of comes in right there. Quite a big bump there, quite a big compression. Mike Rockenfeller behind the wheel of the number 90 that you rode on board with. A problem for the 60. Break. John Pugh with a spin. Engine stays running, and he gets back underway. Pugh being shown in eighth when that spin happened. Everything seems good so far. He gets it back underway. And, you know, as a driver, you don't want to lock the brakes because you don't want to flat spot the tires, but you better go to the brakes because you need to keep the car from rolling. So. We've seen too many incidents today where the cars have rolled back in traffic. This is the battle for third. Fittipaldi getting all sporty there behind Pagano. Uh, you can just see it's, it's really, this is wonderful because all, it, you know, during the off season, we were always wondering what these cars would look like at a track like Sebring in their difference. And you talked about it earlier, Tommy, you can really see the difference between these cars, but in the same way you can here as he goes, the muscle milk car goes down the inside there. Very decisive in traffic. Great move by Kyle, by Kyle Marcelli. He tries to follow the muscle milk car through, and a lot of times you can get that done. The other car in front of you stays out of the way as the faster car goes through, and if you can drop down behind him, you can pick up that space. Yeah, use it for a wedge. Remember, Madison Snow is 18 years old, and so we talked about the silver versus gold. He's mixing it up with Andy Lally, who has seven or eight Rolexes from between championships and winning the race. And uh, Madison Snow definitely holding his own as a silver driver. So we've got more down in the pits with Greg. Well, that we do. I'm with uh, Joe Vardy of the Rum Bum team. And uh, this is really a great story. I mean, Madison Snow out there, they were speculating, you know, is was the handling on the 13 car going off just a little bit? But uh, Madison Snow, I think, is doing a superb job against some awfully good driving talent. Yeah, he's doing great. The kid can really drive. Uh, we, we had to tune on the car because we kind of missed the setup for a little bit. But all the guys over here, they, they worked so darn hard, made everything possible, and, and we're running fine. This was a program, obviously, came together. It's, it's a number of different organizations that really worked to put this together. You guys showed up. It's a car that ran at Daytona, but it's a whole different program in a way, and right away on the pace. Well, John Wright, it, uh, he's the engineer on the car, and Bobby V, they take care of this thing. Uh, they were doing a great job. Uh, doing the engineering work and everything. We just walked into this. It was like a, a match made in heaven. And now if they can only come up with an eye-catching livery, then it would be complete. We've got an off, I guess, one of the Vipers. Yeah, problem for Ryan hunter Ray down in turn 17, and it wasn't just a lazy spin. There's damage to the back of the Viper. Yeah, diffuser and wing. That's a, that's a pretty good hit. Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess maybe they want to get a look at it having him go by, but uh, hopefully all the tires stay up and so forth. Sometimes we have an incident like this, you tell the person to keep going for a lap so they can A, eyeball it, and B, try to scramble and get the parts to save you a little bit of time in fixing it uh, when he comes in. So hopefully this decision doesn't come back and bite him. That's a good point. Uh, the team will have parts. Oh, look at this. This is getting a little racy. You see the 57, the Crone Ferrari trying to get past this battle in GTD in front of him. Marcus Paltala in the 94 right now. The yellow BMW and Tracy Crone in that green, call it Crone green, because it's the only green I've ever seen. Tracy, I think, came up with it on his own. That bright green Ferrari working his way through, and he's trying to get through this battle in front of him in GTD. Almost made contact there. But your point about there's a... Ryan Hunter Ray spinning, makes contact with the tire wall. Your point is, you get two minutes for the crew to get the spare parts together that are back behind the pits. Better than sitting for two minutes 
in pit lane while they run back and get them. So they'll watch the television. Yep. They'll see the damage that's out there on the racetrack. It'll help them make the call as to what parts they want to bring out, and then uh, they'll bring the car in. And now a problem for the 81. This is heading. Uh, he's got a long ways to go. Just, uh, just past turn one. Isn't that how it always works? Yep. You never have a flat in turn 16. I mean, he has, as you say, not just the job of making sure he gets his car back, but making sure that he doesn't get in the way of all the racing that's going to go on. No one wants another yellow right now. So Damien's experience is staying to the inside of the track, but at some point the inside becomes the outside again. So we talked about this at Daytona. The challenge now to go the right speed will feel like you could walk faster, yeah. but you need you need to try to keep that wheel from or tired and turning into a weed whacker and just cleaning out that whole rear fender well, that's because just as it. much time as you lose going slow it's a lot more if you have to start changing parts and it's not just body work that you got to worry about you can take off brake lines you yep. can damage the suspension it's amazing what the carcass of a tire will do while it's coming apart let's check back in the pit lane with darren yeah they were talking i was just talking with bill riley and he said ryan lost it they're not sure exactly why but the reason they kept going was tire pressures looked good. They didn't know how extensive the damage was. And kind of like you guys called it, they wanted to take a quick look and see what they needed before he came in. But I'm at the back of the car right now, you guys. It's got a lot of damage. Uh, both rear fenders in the back, the wings twisted, the uh, diffusers broken. This thing's pretty heavy, hit pretty heavy. That's going to be a big fix. That's not something the little bear bomb's going to do. You can see him beating on the rear window, trying to get it back in. And Damian Faulkner in the back of the shot, limping it around. And, and it, it just shows you how attuned he is as to what's going on. He did move from side to side with his, as he would get to a corner to try to get off the faster line. When he knew he was clear, he would get over and out of the way. And every time you cross, your heart is in your throat. Yep. And the, the next one that's really tough is uh, going down into uh, the, the fast, uh, flat out kink uh, heading into 15 and 16. Um, Anytime you have to cross the racing line is, is scary. If he can get to the back straight away, he can get to driver's right, and then he's good to go exactly. all the way around to the pits. But he's still a long way away from that. You can see it's starting to get a bit more flex right now, isn't it? That's not far off uh, coming off no. there. And, look, there's, there's and of course, at that point, when it shreds, Tommy, that's when it rips. It can it can break, you know, can cut uh, brake lines. It can do all sorts of stuff. So uh, he's going very modestly, but but as, as fast as he can, it's, it's not long off coming off. Horrible for a driver, because, but right now he's being talked to by the team. He's having a lot of communication. They're saying, just get it back at all costs. Let's go to Darren. Hey guys, yeah, they've actually, they've shut the motor off. This thing is, is way, way more damaged than you think. I'm looking at the back of the wing. It's all scraped up, it's bent. I'm looking at the diffuser, like I said, the thing's ripped in half. So, uh, I mean, they're gonna be quite a while. It's not a matter of throwing a little bear bond and sending it down the road. It's, uh, it's going to take quite a bit to put this thing back together. I'd say they're, uh, they're going to have a tough one now. Yeah, th those aren't minor adjustments going on. As you see him beating on that rear piece of bodywork to try to get it sorted out. Meanwhile, up front, Antonio Garcia in the number three Corvette continuing to lead in GTLM right behind him. Ollie Gavin playing tail gunner. You want to know how close these cars are? They're running, what, is that two hundredths, a hundredth off each other, lap after lap after lap without the traffic getting in the way there. That gained him a little bit of time on for Garcia. But, uh, you know, these cars are very equal. They work very hard at making them equal. And right now, Tommy, I think they have, the, obviously at this point, you have the luxury of really analyzing your strategy when you have a two-car team at the front. How, do you hedge your backs at all? Okay, we're gonna go down to the pits right now because the one is pulling in the pits and Greg Kramer is standing right by. Ryan Diabo, I tell you, he was precise. He was gentle. He brought it in. He hit the marks. There is going to be a driver change. Scott Sharp will be getting on board. The crew going after the tires. And the way this is working, how close this battle is, the 0-2 of Kanan had just stopped. So that put the team car, number two, into second. They're going to be in shortly as well. They've got Sharp in, finishing the buckles, now working on the uh, drinks bottle and communication. Tires are done. Fuel is done. Car is down. Trying to get it to start, a problem. It's not firing. Oh no, this is absolutely horrible. Now it comes to life, and he's got an issue. Shaking his head, now he's got drive. He is out, and right behind him, the zero one one has stopped and is exiting as well. Not a good stop. Not a good stop, and, and you talk, 
Greg talked about the engine wouldn't fire. My question is, why did they shut it down? Because the rules are such now that they don't have to be shut down. Some people choose to. I, I know the Corvette guys still shut it down. Um, there's a consideration whether you could knock it into gear uh, while it's up on the stand, and things like that, which you wouldn't want during the tire change. But that highlights what I talked about with the changed pit rules, where you can now do, it used to have to do the fuel and tires separately, which took much longer than the driver change. Now, a lot, if you don't really nail your driver change, you're waiting on the driver change. This race could be decided by a driver change. And the, the good teams will be thinking about that in trying to not do a driver change on their last stop, but depending on if a guy's timed out or whatever, but it's it, it, in GT cars, and in uh, the prototypes, uh, the driver change is way more under pressure now than it was last year. A little switch around in the GTT battle there. Showing in first place is Townsend Bell and then Lee Keen and then Andy Lally, but we're not able to quite see that there. Townsend Bell must have pulled out quite the lead. And there's the look at the two, Simon Pagino. Back to Greg. Yeah, he is in now as well, and of course, with his exchange, he picked up the lead. He will stay in the car, so at this point, it's tires and fuel. And, oh, a problem, a slight problem with the right front. Now they've got that gathered up. Not going to hurt him because they're still doing fuel unless it hangs up getting to the other side. Only two guns now, and uh, it's a bit more of a ballet to get this done down here to get it to work right. They've got the tires on, and they have done it quicker than the fuel. Simon Pagino is down, and he is away cleanly. Oh, almost clipped that tire, but he's clean. He's away. Greg, did they, uh, just a question for Greg, they left the engine running on that one. That's what I was wondering. Greg, Absolutely did they leave the engine? Absolutely, they did. Yeah. I was going to check in and find out if for some reason the engine just cut out or if there was a stall when it came down on the jacks on the one. Haven't been able to get to them yet. I'll get it. Well, I think Tommy had a good point. Maybe when you don't do a driver change, maybe they're electing to leave it running because there is no in and out of the cockpit. You don't have to worry about bumping anything or anything like that. If you're going to stay in the car, we'll just leave it running. If we're going to do a driver change, we'll shut it down at that point in time. We saw the driver change on the one. There was not a driver change on the two. Look at that bump at the exit of one. There's the zero one flashes by and then the five of Christian Fittipaldi. Things cycling through just routine pit stops right now and it's going to take a lap or so to get the tires up to temperature and up to pressure. I also talked about, look at, oh, cool. <laughs> look at that. The mummy. It is truly amazing what Bear Bond will do. And that is the product that they're holding this car back together with. It is like quadruple ply duct tape in massive sheets. A invented by a former crew guy of mine, Mr. Ross Jeffries. And all the teams use it up and down pit lane. You'll see them get it ready. They'll take it off in strips and stick it on the pit box, waiting for the car to come in, and then they'll just slap it on. I'm, I'm convinced that we could probably tape Justin up to the wall with a couple of pieces of it. I'm not sure it's strong enough to take me up to the wall, but it's hard to get off once it's on. I mean, it, it'll it sticks. <laughs> it sticks to anything. It, it, it works. Hence, bear bond. Bear bond. Yep. Sit down to the pits and Greg. Well, Mr. Dial, I think you might just be saying after uh, the way things are going so far, this is more like it. What a drive, what a run by the team. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously Daytona didn't go as planned, but uh, we felt we had pretty decent race pace there. We knew we didn't have enough probably to be on the podium, but um, we've been getting full of confidence this week, and the team has done a great job. So, you know, obviously it's a, a home race for the team and also the second run of the Tequila Patron and Juris Cup. So, we got to show well here, keep the boss happy, but the car's running great. I only, I wish the yellows were a little long, uh, shorter because we really struggle on the restarts. Um, but the longer the runs go, the longer the green runs go, the better we are. So let's hope it stays green. It's not going to happen. You've been having some absolutely great speed. The question I have, you seem to be being fairly effective in traffic where you would have thought the little horsepower advantage that the uh, DPs have would help them. But it looks good. No, I, I can honestly say that Driving this current configuration is the hardest I've ever driven for traffic. Um, and they do have that more nimble acceleration. So uh, it's kind of frustrating when you're following them because they can kind of get past people in places that we can. But, you know, it seems like it's quite even right now. And, you know, the lap times are pretty close. So this is what everybody wants. I mean, this is what everybody can complain that this couldn't be done. Um, and we go up DPP2, first and second. So it's uh, all Greg Demsa. And, Let's hope we stay there. 
Gotta ask you real quick, when you guys do a driver change, are you shutting the car off or did it just die somehow? No, we, we're keeping the engine running, but I don't know what happened there. It stalled when they dropped the car. Um, so I, I don't know what to figure out what happened, but it's early, we're we'll okay. Absolutely, if you keep driving the way you were, congratulations, man. Scott Sharp back on track, really beginning to put pressure on the 42 of Alex Brundle in front. I found it interesting that one of your former crewmen created Bear Bond. Is there, is there a reason that it was a former crewman of your necessity as the mother of invention? It was after I retired. <laughs> just checking. I was just checking. But the inspiration was probably there. Yeah, <laughs> he got it earlier. Look at those two Corvettes. They are really not separated by much. And of course, not far behind, we have Patrick Long. Patrick's a hard charger. I mean, these Porsches have been a little bit through the mill this week, but nine, the Porsche 912 is, number 912, is certainly uh, within, still within striking distance. It doesn't take much traffic for him to be right on the back of those Corvettes. And actually, Patrick's lap times are, well, they're exactly in the same place. I mean, they're, the leader, Antonio Garcia, just ran a 2.012. Gavin did a two-minute flat point nine. Patrick Long, a 2.01.8. So slightly slower, but uh, the Porsche is certainly in a good place at this stage of the race with five hours left to go. And I'm glad we had that shot of the prototype going by because the previous Apex, he missed by a considerable margin. I thought, well, maybe the car's sliding around a little bit. We got the outside shot, and I think Patrick looked in his mirror and went, is he going to stick his nose in there? I'm going to give him a little bit of extra room. It's great to see Patrick Long back in a car with Jörg Bergmeister here this weekend. I mean, they're a driver pairing. They won championships together. Um, they've won some great races together. Both Patrick and Jörg have won here at Sebring. Jörg actually has a couple of wins here. Patrick has one, but it's a neat driver pairing, and I've yet to figure out how it works considering the height differential. Well, it's like you and me doing a stand-up. The long and the short of it. And the short. <laughs> The long and the long. You, you anyway, went there. Yep. Um, I, I was talking about, uh, I caught up with, I mentioned it with Ollie Gavin, and I asked him to kind of handicap things for me. And he said he felt like their car had good pace. Uh, he said he, he's run around the Porsches a bunch at Daytona and here. He says they're a little quicker down the straightaway, but he felt that they were better under braking. And uh, and in some, uh, like in 13, than, than the, the Porsche. But he thought, and then he also thought the Corvette was maybe a little bit stronger or easier on tires than, and not just the Porsche, but he felt like that that might be an edge for the Corvette across the board, that he thought that they were able to maintain pace longer through a stint than uh, for most of the other cars. Fantastic camera shot there, looking inside with Patrick Long. But we're so lucky these days with the camera technology and the transmission technology we have that we can actually ride along. Uh, right now, you are watching at home online as you are joining oh, Patrick Long no. in his car. This is terrible. Oh, a problem no. for the Rumbum number 13 it had been running so well. Madison Snow still behind the wheel, but definitely off pace. And it looks like all the all the tires are up. So, what? and the car has power. It's not rolling to a stop, but is it down on the right rear? It doesn't no. I have a fuel pressure alarm on my dash. The fuel pressure alarm basically means that it's uh, <laughs> whether it's either out of gas or it's not finding the gas. Back and forth, okay, buddy. Rocket back and forth here, okay. You now try to get some fuel sloshing around. You know, when you're a youngster like Madison Snow, it doesn't matter how many races you've won. It's great to have the voice of somebody like Joe Vardy on the radio to you, Greg. What do you hear? Well, pretty much what you guys are hearing on the radio, it suddenly just lost all fuel pressure. You heard the instructions, rock it back and forth, do whatever you can, just try and bring it home. The whole tenor in that pit stall had changed. I went down and asked, and they just said fuel. Otherwise, we're not sure. Well, and, and ideally, when your car runs out, you, you want to- get ready. You may need to run down there and push him up in our box, okay? Joe Vardy saying to the crew guys, get ready, because if he ends up not rolling to a stop at the beginning of pit lane, but I don't say, think he's, he's going to make, make a decision pit right now, Brian. He, he, the cutoff was behind him on the right. Did he just make a, a, a not a, a, just a poor judgment call? On the right, just behind him was the cutoff, and in the driver's meeting, you're shown where each of those are. And uh, right now, he's right on the inside. The cars do get sight of it. They have vision on him as they're coming up to turn 16. Fortunately, it's not blind. Cycle the middle 
all switches up, all the way to the up position. So all the cars have a reserve, which theoretically you want to make sure your reserve has a full lap uh, yeah, anywhere you go. Oh, see, that's just uh, that's just a lack of experience. All of his experience, or most of it, has been in in shorter races. Start but it, Madison. Try to start it. She's back underway. Develop your thought there, Tommy. What do you yeah. think? Well, basically, what you, you you do is you run until you get a stumble. Then you go to reserve, and uh, uh, virtually every track except maybe Le Mans, hopefully there, you can maybe get a full lap. just get it going as fast as you can here, buddy, then we're going to coast it, okay, buddy? Go as fast as you get it going here. You can or you can coast it. That's experience right there and Joe Vardy saying, don't be limping it around anymore. See if you can get ahead of steam, yeah, and we'll coast, roll it yeah. all the way around. It's interesting. I would a team of this caliber, I would believe, would know exactly how far they could go. Yeah. You Did he just forget to turn on the reserve, or all of a sudden are they not picking up the fuel they need to? Well, two things can happen. When you, I mean, the procedure you should run it till it coughs, then hit reserve, come around. If you don't take it off reserve when you fill it uh, up, ah, there's yeah, that's a possibility. Um, but he got it going again. So, yep. oh, you yep. know what? It could have been when it came to a rest, it, it picked a little bit more fuel up. But ideally, you want it to when it starts to get low pressure, it should be out completely. That means you're getting all the fuel out of the tank, maximum range on a tank of fuel. It's not good when you get in a situation like this, though. And I apologize, Madison. You shouldn't have pulled off the track in that spot. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you made the right call. He could have cut behind the FIA curb. Uh, that's yeah, they could have yeah, done that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for giving Got me a little bit of credibility left. We're so though. good sitting here. Yeah. In the air conditioning with a, with no pressure. Driver change is going to go ahead. It's going to be Matt Plum. Off 13, Matt Plum is getting in. Uh, I'm sure after that little experience, Madison's probably quite keen to get out and have a chat with the team. Uh, but, you know, this is what will make him a great driver in years to come. He's a really good driver now. To become a great, great driver, you know, you win the big ones and you get years of experience. And this kind of thing, he won't do it twice if he did. It, if he had made a mistake, and he'll know what to do next time if it was nothing to do with him. So, really, this is a, it's all part of life's rich tapestry. See the number 10 pulling out, and Matt Plum, who's a Continental Tire GS champion from last year, takes over the rum bomb entry. And every time I watch one of those crew guys jump up on the hood, of a Porsche to fuel it, I, ju I just kind of cringe a little bit. Yeah, I was. I, I haven't. I guess been paying enough attention because I. What, what's happened? It used to be a lot closer to the front bumper years ago, but as the focus on weight distribution and so forth, they've moved that tank as far back as they can, get it a center, and so the the filler is way up up uh, close to the windshield yeah, there. Yeah, I got it. It was funny because you know Porsche lent me a lovely 911 to go out to Daytona, and it does raise some eyebrows when you do that. At, you know. At your local gas station, you just leap on the hood <laughs> and, and then realize that it's, it's, it's just slightly to the right. Well, the There's 13 back you, out. <laughs> Townsend Bell, though, leading in the 555 Ferrari in the GT Daytona category. He and his teammates won at the Rolex 24 in that class. Can they win again? Right now, Tony Kanaan leading overall from the 60-second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Number four Corvette, Ollie Gavin drops out of second place in GTLM and heads for pit road. And I would think at this point in time, should be a routine stop because Gavin has had a great run, Greg. Well, he has that and his crew uh, certainly has kept them right in there, of course, as they always do. Cars up, going for the tires, going with fuel, and uh, Ollie's gonna stay in. They, they, one of the things Dan Biggs told me about these two cars one of the things in this new car that they've reworked is the AC. He said it is an absolute delight for these drivers. They get out, and that's obviously giving them a little bit of an advantage. And interestingly, all right, that car is away. They shut it off. They restarted. It fires fine, and Ollie has made it go. But that was one of the things they really said they wanted to refine was the AC units in these cars to keep these drivers comfortable when they do these long stints. He looks comfortable as can be as he heads back on the racetrack. And it's interesting, there are so many Good young drivers we were talking about. Connor Felipe is one of those good young drivers coming up, uh, drives for Porsche, and I kind of hate Twitter. I, I Actually, like it. I don't it, like it. it. I don't hate it. I like it. Wiki, it's better than Wikipedia. Yeah, so Connor let us know that uh, the GT America actually doesn't have a reserve. 
So that's interesting. Was it a miscalculation or a fuel pickup problem on the part of the rum bump guys? Right. I'm sure I'll get a tweet on that one too. Now I'm wondering, you know, the, the guys do their own changes once they get the cars within the limits they're allowed. I'm wondering why they said make sure the fuel is in the all the way up position. There seemed to be, and that seemed to be after that uh, instruction, the car did seem to fire. So whether they've done something different from stock spec on their GT America, or uh, it just was a matter of the car settling and, and getting a little bit of fuel across that pickup to get it running again. Yeah, and Mike Hedlund let me know there was actually John Wright on the radio, not Joe Vardy, but they sound exactly alike. It sounded like Joe Vardy to me. Pagano in the two, being shown in second place, trying to close the gap down to Canaan. And one more time, you look at the balance of performance between the Daytona prototype cars and the P2-based cars, and it looks pretty darn good, and Pagano has his sights set on Canaan. Number three, Corvette to the stops. Greg? The comeback kids are in, and you can see now some of that 200-mile-an-hour tape starting to fold up on the front of that. We'll see if they address it. At this point, no driver change plan, but they are in doing a little bit of work in the... No, they did do the driver change. All right, that makes sense now. They are doing the driver change. They've got the... Uh, Fuel is going in. A little problem with the right rear corner, but again, the fuel was still going in. Driver change done. Fuel is out. They're up and away. And all they did was just tap that tape back down. So hopefully it'll stick here, but it's starting to peel back. Hopefully that won't come loose any farther. It'll be interesting to see where it cycles out compared to the other vet. Coming in the frame on the back of the right. The four did not do a driver change. The three did. And this, this is, is going to be the difference. But remember, the four now has a lap on those tires. So there's going to be temperature, there's going to be pressure, and good stop for the three, especially considering it was a driver change. But he has not stayed in front yet. No. Now, it'll be interesting. I'm, what's Doug Feehan saying right now? He's in front, he's got you, leave him there? I, that's usually, unless you can go by easily, I think that's generally how they operate things. Um, he may get him down under braking here as if he's all hot and wound up. So, unfortunately, we just can't see that. We're following Pagano, um, Scott Sharp right there. But now he did. Oh, he did. Slid down the inside. I thought with his tires hotter under braking, he probably can make a little bit more of a move down into there. And, of course, they're teammates. But they are also well, racing I drivers who need to say. represent their side of this team very well. And uh, as we've seen, when these cars have been running nose to tail for the last hour, uh, it would be nice to be the front one. I think Corvette has actually a more strict inter intra team uh, policy than the other teams. Like at the Vipers, we were we were allowed to race each other uh, with the instruction you don't you don't get in each other. I think a lot of times in that Corvette team, they're asked to hold station, um, and they and it's put pressure on the pit crews because that's the only place they can swap swap positions. Right behind the Corvette, you see the number nine from Action Express being shown right now in seven. That's Bert Frizzell behind the wheel. And earlier today, we heard that Brian Frizzell had gotten sick in the car, and they might be down to only two drivers for the remainder of the event. And uh, let's check in with Darren Law and see if he has any update on Brian Frizzell. Yeah, guys, I went and asked the team and checked in with them, and you are correct. He, uh, he actually threw up inside the car, oh. went to medical, Poor John had to get in afterwards, but uh, went to medical. A medical because of the uh, loss of hydration, they will not let him back in the car for the rest of the race. So those two guys are on their own the rest of the way through. And we said it at the time. I talked to their dad, Brad, up in uh, up in one of the suites between stints, and he said uh, he feels fine now. But uh, unfortunately, I said, did the nurse tell anyone? Said yes. Unfortunately, she did. So oh. um, it, it's going to be really tough. We're going those guys to balance that drive limit and not get one of the guys over four hours in any six hours. And still have a driver fresh enough at the end of the race to be able to mount a charge if you're anywhere close to the front. Yeah, they're going to actually have to watch that, that time thing, yep. and however the drivers work out is just how they're going to work out. Simon Pagano out in front. Pagano with the lead, Canaan. Now back in second, Marino Franchitti being shown in third. Take a look for the pass for the overall lead. Traffic. Good move. Good move. Kanan just gets balked in traffic. And then it looks like Pagano is going to get balked in traffic, too. I'm surprised Kanan not able to mount a charge down the back straightaway. I suspect he defended pretty, yep. 
job in traffic. Beautiful job in traffic. Oh, that was oh. a good eye by Kanan because the yeah. Turner car did not know he was there. And that, and that kink, it track gets real narrow. Real quick. Yep. Especially yeah. if you're on the inside about to be pinched. That was good riding. And also, I, I just could see the way I think um, Pagano actually just lifted a little bit early in the middle of that corner, rotated it, and got hard on it coming down as part of his uh, defensive strategy there. Simon's doing very well through, through the traffic here. You've got to hand it, though, haven't you? Every year, I... Tequila Patron, the paint schemes on their cars are going to live in sports car folklore in the same way we're going to be buying models of these cars forever. Uh, my son just loves them. They, they do such a good job with their design. Their graphics team must be amazing. That's worrying. Yeah, well, I, I, I know I was going to comment on that too, but... You, you, I don't like where your minds go. Let's just talk about that black and silver car then. <laughs> Townsend Bell in the 555. Your two leaders in GT, GT Le Mans going by the leader in GT Daytona. Another good run for Townsend Bell and Bill Sweedler together. And you talked about it earlier. I think he's found the class and the car that suits Bill's driving style. And he brings Townsend along with him. He's got a great co-driver in Townsend and, and it's a good pairing and the results have shown it. They work really well together, and Bill uh, has so much trust in Townsend. Townsend has so much trust in Bill because Bill does the right thing by Townsend the whole time, lets him do, you know, set up the car and work with it. And uh, you know, Townsend, when we do these shut up and drive shows that we do as he enters the pit lane, I tell you, it's very hard to beat that guy because there's a part of his brain that's always on a different altitude <laughs> when it comes to driving fast. Let's see how this pit stop goes for him as he comes down. Very important. My guessing is he will stay in the car as they are in that top spot. And let's see how it rotates through as he drives his way down. He's actually been in the car two hours and five minutes right now, so uh, maybe my prediction won't go true of him staying in, but let's hope it's a clean stop because they need it. They're right at the pointy end. Hey guys, Darren, I'm, down, I'm down here with the uh, Daytona winning Ferrari and no, Townsend is not staying in the car. They're putting Jeff Siegel in the car right now. And in speaking with Ian Willis, the uh, team manager for the program, he says, we are just running at basic pace. Steady, careful, trying to stay out of trouble. Um, they're just hoping everything's going well and they're staying clean. So everything is routine as it goes right now and they're just running their pace and trying to avoid any incidents. Car looks great and there's no dings or scratches across it. And as we just saw, they took off the tear off on the windscreen, uh, windshield, you call it windshield, windscreen? Because uh, drivers, least favorite moment of sports car racing is when the sun is going down and we have a beautiful clear evening here at Sebring for the 60 second running and what will happen is as you, Jeff gets in the car they're trying to give him the fairest advantage he has you're getting in the sun it's still very bright out there right now but you don't want a bug ridden oil splattered screen as you're starting this very hard next stint it is 20 to 6 here on the Saturday evening and the sun is getting low. Well, and there is a look at the 44 Andy Lally behind the wheel. That's the second place car in GTD. So great stop for the guys at AIM Autosport. They got that 555 back out with a driver change and never lost position. And we have the potential to have something I'm not sure has ever happened. You have a team in Sweetler Bell that won Daytona and might win here with totally different teams. At Daytona, it was level five. The car looks exactly the same. And I talked to the town and said, how lucky are we that here was another turnkey championship caliber uh, effort that could just pick it up like they, ne like they never left off. And so obviously a lot of race left to run, but uh, incredible that they could pick up with no slack. Check back down in the uh, aim pit with Darren. Townsend, you guys obviously had a great run at Daytona and you had the switch teams. You've had a, a little bit of a change coming into this, but you guys picked up right where you left off. The car's running great. You had a beautiful stint. How's everything? I'm so proud of all these Revo guys. I mean, to have no testing and show up like we did, it was a scramble, but we got it together. The Ferrari is just really hooked up right now. Our little BMW is pretty fast too, but uh, we're having a good run, just trying to click off quick laps, make smart decisions and see if we can repeat. Yeah, it looks like, I mean, the car is clean. There's been a lot of attrition out there with a lot of problems. Have you had any real issues with other cars? Not really. I mean, we've all made smart decisions. I got great teammates, Bill Sweetler, Maurizio Mediani, and, uh, and Jeff Siegel. Smart guys, experienced guys. So if we all do our jobs, we'll have a good day. All right, guys. These guys are definitely uh, contenders for this one. Hope they can pull off another one.
Yeah, they'd like to get a win. They got a win in GTC in 2012 here. Bill Sweedler and Townsend Bell did together. It was actually Townsend's first ever sports car race, so he's a little spoiled now. He's got a Sebring win. He's got a Daytona win. You should try making a show with him. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? I mean, I have to say, we've become firm friends, and his commitment to his level, as I just said, I wasn't joking. He has a commitment level almost like on right. And he does Indy. The one Indy car race he does a year is the 500. And Tommy, that is not an easy thing to do. He dials himself up for that one. He sure does. He's an impressive guy, impressive kid. Uh, you guys run hard. You, you've never crashed a car, though, have you, on that show? Do you know, I love the way the paint scheme on this car looks as you go around. You're so sick. Did, what, <laughs> yeah, you're did so he answer mean. your question? No, I, I don't think he did. No. I, Maybe you didn't hear Tommy's question. Did you hear Tommy's You know question? what I like to do? I like to frame it as in, what is an accident, right? <laughs> you know? So you did it on purpose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyway, moving Has on. Has the car ever been damaged? We are actually shooting the next episode of Shut Up and Drive in a couple of weeks. It's becoming very popular, and uh, this time we're going to be doing it maybe on the West Coast, a little closer to home. And you're wishing I would shut up and talk right now instead of any, yeah, well, we should any just animals shut up and do your job the on filming TV. of any of your shows? Not intentionally either, no. <laughs> um, that's Shut Up and Shoot. That's your show, Brian. Okay, let's, let's get back uh, down to the action here. Look at that. Scott Sharp is following the old car He's down into the He's been behind Brundle uh, for his whole entire stint. And worrying him a little bit. Be interesting to see if Simon Pagano can stay up front. There has never been a Honda powered car or chassis win overall here at the Mobile 112 Hours of Sebring. We still have a long way to go, 440 left in this race. so. Almost two sprint races left, so there's plenty of time. Well, they're hustling. Look at the car was moving around under Brundle's feet there as he's coming out to that corner. I mean, he is pushing very hard. Nice overtaking there. All you ask for when you are one of the slower categories is for a decisive decision by both people. Be predictable. And uh, right now, we've got a nice pattern going. Simon Pagano leading for Extreme Speed Motorsports overall, and Corvette's running up front in Grand Touring Le Mans. Plenty more action coming your way from Sebring International Raceway right after this short break. Sebring is, is, a, is a super aggressive, tough circuit to race on. You can never relax. It's, it's physically and mentally very hard. It's when it gets dark, how difficult it is, how dark it is. The diversity uh, that is thrown at you um, is usually what creates the adversity. Welcome back to the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. We've had great battles all around the racetrack since the drop of the green, and right now Simon Pagano is leading. Beautiful day for racing here at Sebring. Let's take a look at our six highlights or lowlights. 08, Alex Tagliani was leading in the PC category until this. The 87 trying to recover from a spin, pulls out in front of Tagliani. Huge impact, Tommy. Every time I watch that, I, 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 I think, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And, you know, just some, some real carnage. Uh, you see uh, Tag holding his, generally okay, but holding his wrist gingerly. We Halfway leader Ryan Dial wins the SRT Halfway Leader Award in his Extreme Speed Motorsports HPD prototype. And they've had a good run with both cars all day long. Pagano leads now, and Scott Sharp just a little bit further back. And we talk about the traffic around this racetrack. 63 cars took the green flag. Look at this. <laughs> yeah, I think the Audi probably went. <laughs> Probably went, uh, what just happened there? Just that a, was a great move. Look as he moves up into third place there. Fantastic. That's having some trust, having some faith, and putting it in there. And that's Simon Pagano. It's why he's up front right now. Take a look at your race summary right now. It's Pagano who leads. James Gouet leading in the 54. That core autosport team, the 54, won the Rolex 24. They're having a good run. GT Le Mans, the Corvettes. They suffered some mechanical woes at the Rolex 24, but they seem to have those under control. And in GTD, Jeff Siegel out in front in the 555 Ferrari for AIM Autosport. And we're 36 minutes away for the next batch of points being handed out for the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Cup. 
Uh, we saw some uh, some strategy moves and some really bold by the Viper and some really bold driving by Sage Karam to try to uh, uh, keep those points, not necessarily for the O2, but to keep them out of the hands of Bordet. You can see Pagano, a pretty good lead. Hard to see the second place car of Tony Kanan. And in the other prototype category, there's the 54 with James Gouet behind the wheel. John Bennett, what a great Rolex 24 he had. Obviously co-driving in this car with Colin Brown, James Gouet, and Mark Wilkins. But while he won as a driver, he also won as a team owner in GTLM as the Core Autosport Porsche took the victory there. It's great to say, you know, a year ago, James was sitting in Marion's hospitality behind here, not knowing where his career was going. And as I was saying to his father, what a great thing about this sport. That's the drug that keeps us coming back. Because a year later, you can be leading your category at the same race. So that's uh, what keeps us all there. James driving so well, and I'm glad the team have given him this opportunity. Well, it's that never give up kind of attitude that keeps you coming back, and that's exactly what James Gouet has done. You talk about that never give up attitude, that's exactly what Corvette Racing has. We know that. We talked about mechanical issues at the Rolex 24. The four car had a transmission problem, and they have had smooth sailing today. No mechanical woes there. So well, far, knock on wood. And the three had a pretty substantial hit, uh, got pushed by the Porsche into the BMW. Uh, and uh, had to change that whole nose structure. They did it, only lost one lap, had the lap back, and are now running a strong second place uh, with Ryan Briscoe behind the wheel in the three car now. Get that good split screen on board with Ollie Gavin. You see the outside shot of the four and exactly what Gavin's going through on the inside. It's like sitting on a paint shaker down at the hardware store. Look at his head bouncing. Stint. Yeah, look at his head bouncing around there. Of course, paddle shift is saving the day now, the way these cars are engineered. Everything on that Corvette, if you've been up closer, when you look at it, it's so beautifully engineered. There's, they, that's what happens when a team evolves to a certain level. They have great budget, great drivers. Look at his hands move there. That was great. And that is not even the fastest corner in the track. I yeah. love to look at their eyes from those onboard cameras. The 555, speaking of eyes, the Revo Ferrari, the 555, Jeff Siegel now behind the wheel. And they've done some advancements on that vet. Um, Safety-wise, they've got that uh, energy-absorbing foam that is not mandated by the series. I think the series ought to look at maybe putting that on all the cars on the side, on that side of those door bars. Um, but they are always innovating. They really put a premium on, on driver comfort because they really think it's a performance advantage. As we look at our GTD leader, you're also looking at the battle for fifth in the prototype category. The pink and black number 42, Alex Brundle, trying to hold off Scott Sharp. Sharp took over from Ryan Dial, who had been running in the lead. Now Sharp's, Sharp's dropped back a little bit, Brundle moving forward. But that's just the ebb and flow that we've seen in that class all day long. Yeah, Brundle's really quite uh, aggressive in traffic, but you have to be in the nature of these uh, those prototypes, they can do it. But look, this is definitely a gaggle heading down the backside there of the track. Saw the Team Falcon tire Porsche in there, the third car in your shot, the number 17. They're running fourth in GTLM, having another good Sebring run. They always seem to run relatively quickly here. The 55 of Bill Auberlin running seventh. They had a pretty good run going, but then they ended up with some damage on the right front. You can still see the remnants of it from the onboard from the 93. Kuno Wittmer just behind. Some damage to the right front of the 94 of Dane Cameron, who's running third in GTD. So that's what it's been like. You've got these four different classes out here, and the speeds are very similar in a lot of the slower corners. And it's just a matter of you do have to be aggressive, kind of a controlled aggression to get it in there, make sure it's a measured approach. But at the same point in time, you can't hesitate. And those oak guys I talked to around the paddock, the, the Ferrari guys were ID'd as being really aggressive and only having one speed in the GTLM category. When I talked to the P2 guys, they said those oak guys are all young and real chargers. So whether they, you know, they seem to be expressing some concern if you could keep it on the island driving that hard, but they've done it. They've won Le Mans. They've, uh, they were competitive at, at Daytona, the only competitive P2 car really, and now uh, in the hunt here. Yeah, as you just look down there, as they came down the street, you can see backlit. The track is getting very dirty offline. And with the nature of multi-class racing, you've got to go offline to overtake. So, Brian, I have a feeling that 
running out wide, you've got to clean your tires, and that is no fun. It's part of the challenge of Sebring. More to come from the 60-second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring coming your way after this short break. Make sure you stay with us. Back at Sebring, Brian Sellers flashes by in that blue and turquoise colored Team Falcon tire portion right behind him, the number 90 from Spirit of Daytona. They did not give up. They had problems early on, but Richard Westbrook now behind the wheel, and they're going to continue to run. Wow, late pit in for the 0-2, Tony Kanaan. It could be that he got the call late, or he was just trying to dig for every last little tenth, and it, his momentum was carrying to the left uh, uh, just to shave a few tenths off pit end. Yeah, Tommy, that was all about getting it into pit lane. They've been cutting him down from about four laps ago, telling him to come in. He's going to hand over to Sage Karam. Scott Dixon is going to finish out the day in the 0-2 car. You know, looking at the nose of this car, oh, a little fall here up on the right front uh, as a tire changer came across the front of the car. Pretty amazed that these dive planes have stayed in place. I was worried about the Fords all weekend long. These dive planes stick very far out. I think the only car that uh, lost a dive plane earlier was the 60 car. Uh, but really, the Ganassi cars, no problems there other than in practice a, a day or so ago. Tony Kanaan already over uh, sitting down behind pit wall here. He's been sick, so we're going to try and uh, let him take his helmet off here. I don't think he's going to do any more driving today. As I said, Scott Dixon is going to finish this thing out. Tony a little, little slow to get his helmet off. Spoke with uh, Mike Hall earlier. He said they're still dealing with a car that has a little bit of understeer. Tony, good stint there. You were running behind one of your IndyCar competitors, Simon Pagano, for about the last half an hour, pushing pretty hard. How are you feeling? Uh, I started to get tired and dehydrated. Obviously, uh, I'm not in my best form, but uh, I had fun, man. We had a good battle for almost two stints. So, uh, track's getting pretty slick at this time of the year, the, the, the day. It's what it is. And our car's a little bit oversteer, but, you know, I did my best. So, we'll see what Sage and Scott can do right now. Looks like the common thread at the front is the Corvettes, the extreme speed cars, and then the Ganassi 02. What kind of shootout are we going to see at the end? I think uh, if we always stay out of trouble, you're going to see a shootout between those cars. And uh, I think the, for the fans at home and here watching, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, get some fluids and get some rest. I will, thank you. He's not in the best of shape right now. Yeah, he probably just did a, a triathlon or Tuesday. something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's recovering. He's in one of the most fit drivers I think I've ever seen. So if uh, he's got a bug that's putting him down, then it's got to be a pretty strong bug. There's the 63 Lorenzo Case. You saw the red Ferrari there running fourth in GTD. There's the nine and the zero nine. And there's the zero two. He's rejoined. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get frustrated because you're running up there at the front and then you drop back, but you just got to say, I, I know that's going to happen. We still have four hours and 27 minutes to go in this thing. And for Sage Karam to move forward, he he's thoroughly enjoying the sports car stuff. I talked to him the other day and he said, you know what? No, I wasn't really good at sharing in the beginning, but I had to learn. And the whole idea of the sports car racing is really sitting well with him right now. Problems for the 81 from GB Autosport. They've had an up and down day. They've run well at times, but then they've had some issues throughout the day. And you see some smoke coming off the left rear. Is yeah, that that's... rub or is that something coming out of the no, hub? No, well, the, the tire's down. And yeah, look at the front oh, right. Which, like, we've seen the left front on that car also. Uh, I need to put my glasses yeah. on. So it's supposed to actually have air in it, huh? Yeah. Some. Something that's... like that. On board the 912, Michael Christensen behind the wheel. Christensen, a great lap to put the 912 on pole here. First time here. First time here, yeah. These well, young guys. He, these young guys. He doesn't know enough to be afraid. Yeah, That's yeah. the deal. I will say this, you know, in years past, looking at the previous iterations of the RSR, um, the car porpoised a little bit more than I see this one moving. The car seems to have a much more stable platform when you watch it over the bumps, both in 17 and in one, yeah, it still gets jostled around. It's going to, anything will. But doesn't it seem to be a lot more stable to you? Oh, it, I, well, I think it's, it's a bigger platform. The overall car dimensions are bigger. I mean, the aerodynamics are drastic. I mean, it's better in every way, and, uh, and it's shown it. Um, you know, going to Le Mans last year, we'd never seen the new car. Uh, we'd been racing against the old car here in the States, and they, uh, they showed that, you know, Porsche, they don't, they don't mess around. They're really, it, it's better in every way than the old car. Nick Tandy 
in the second of the two Porsches that you see in the 911. It's really confusing for us to say the yeah. 911 is the 911 that's yeah right. behind the 911 that's actually yeah. the 912. Now for the hardcore, which I guess if you're following us on IMSA.com uh, or Fox Sports Go, you know this, but that paint job it doesn't make any sense until you see the cars from above, and it's this new corporate paint job. The the new uh, LMP1 car also has the same, and it basically it spells out a portion of it in three lines. Uh, Porsche Intelligent Performance, and so um, when you just see it from here, it's like, oh, that's a funny-looking paint job. You may um, also, when you're, when you're, I mean, the, the pictures. If you go online, guys, if you haven't yet, you're online right now. So uh, Google search that uh, the paint scheme because it looks amazing from on top. From it was a press there. release done. Sometimes uh, those of you that might not have raced that are watching this may wonder why they make a, a shift earlier than the revs sound like they need, especially coming out of 17. The reason for that is sometimes you have to time your shift so as not to be shifting in the middle of the bump or indeed after one of the big bumps. So when you get into a rhythm out there, like certainly Michael is right now, he's short shifting in certain places to keep the car planted. We had seen Nick Tandy right behind Christensen Tandy, five laps off the GTLM lead, but your overall leader, Simon Pagano, is in. Simon Pagano handing over to Johannes van Overbeek. Looking at this car, this car looking pretty good. Coming around the back end, though, you see some damage at that right rear corner. They call those uh, wedges of cheese down there, helping some of that air pull out from the under tray. So you got to kind of wonder, is this car 100%? We'll talk to Simon in just a second. But it's going to be fuel and tires for the two car. Scott Sharp was in just one lap ago, and they just did fuel on that car. So interesting to see. Splitting the strategy, maybe trying to get Scott Sharp to close up a little bit with the, the leader uh, leaders there by just going fuel there and double stinting those tires. Simon Pagel a little slow to get his helmet off, so we'll talk to him in a minute. We also saw the five of Christian Fittipaldi coming down pit road. He's to his marks in the Action Express camp and uh, looks like they're going to change the water bottle, but I don't see a driver change going on. So Fittipaldi will stay in. He gets a new drink bottle. He gets four new Continental tires and a load of fuel. I'm so impressed with this team. You and I talked about chemistry early on and this team it looks like a routine stop andrew everything good everything looks absolutely fine here this team of course still uh, not using the paddle shift system but the all the way. guys you might have missed that but i had to do one of my famous runs down <laughs> to see that and you know i'm getting a bit old for that but yeah, yeah fantastic atmosphere down here and isn't it terrific now that this race has finally got a rhythm? This is what we came to see. And we're going to have a great battle all the way. Let's hope we have no more of those incidents. Uh, this could be a stunning last three or four hours here. Absolutely, Andrew. And Tommy, we were talking about chemistry. Action Express seems to have finally found the recipe, put it all together. They were stunning at the Rolex 24, great in the test leading up to it. And the same thing has been true here. Yeah, it's, it's been a talented group of guys for a long time that have come from all over, including Gary Nelson, longtime uh, NASCAR crew chief, it was, and then was the lead official at NASCAR as the top executive, Elton Sawyer, uh, and just a really deep group. And they seem to, I think, stability and not making too many changes there has, you know, they finally gelled and, uh, and the results are, are stunning. What Fittipaldi has to do now is get up to speed pretty quickly because he's got people all over him behind with a little warmer, Continental tires, so they're going to be very, very quick and Fittipaldi under pressure. But talk about pressure, man who certainly handled it well and delivered some pretty intense blows out on the racetrack. Simon Pagano is with Chris Neville. Yeah, indeed, he did handle that pressure well. He's had a chance to get his helmet off, his tequila Patron hat on. Simon, that was a great run there. How's the car working? It's getting better with the rubber coming down on the racetrack. The car is getting better and better with, uh, with the Continental tires. So. Uh, I got in a really good rhythm, and it was uh, it was very enjoyable to drive. And uh, you know, it's one of those sweet moments in racing when you get in that bubble. And uh, I had a really good time. Traffic is getting a little easier, also, uh, since there were so many DNF. So we uh, we're having an easier time now. I noticed a little bit of damage at the back end of the car. Is that slowing you guys down at all? A little bit of damage at the back end of the car. Is that slowing you down at all? Didn't notice anything. How are you guys going to finish out your driver rotation? Uh, Johan. Johan S is going to get back in. He's in now, and uh, I believe Ed is going to go back in and I'll finish. So. All right. Have a good run. You see the relationship there on track as they flash by, and then the two. 
So good stuff. The 42, Alex Brundle was in the pits, came out and worked his way back into the serial. Holly Gavin still leading in GTLM. Duncan Indy in Prototype Challenge. Jeff Siegel in the GTD class. And you can feel the intensity start to pick yeah. up now because we're getting, you know, we're still four hours and 20 minutes to the end, but we haven't been having the same rash of yellows. So the longer you go without a yellow and the closer you get from the end, people will start going, oh, we might have to start pulling these guys back in. And so it just, it, it, it kind of ratchets up together. And you've got these four cars running right together. This has been a, an intriguing battle. Scott Pruitt in the 01, you've got the 10 with uh, Ricky Taylor on board and hanging in there, Scott, Scott Sharp. And they've had an intense battle for the last couple of laps. It's, oh, as we see the GT cars here right now, they join up, but that is our leader, Van Overbeck, going down the back straight. Clean air, clean track. Uh, he should be able to lay down some pretty fast lap times right now. His last, uh, last lap actually was including his outlap, so we'll have to see as he goes past what's, what times he's doing, but Look at the car bounce as it goes through turn 17. Even when you're on your own, with no traffic, this is a handful. And you saw the crisp turn in into 17. In these cars, what he's doing there is he's doing a real crisp turn in to point into the corner, but still breaking a straight line. He's he's turning it and then and then going straight into the car up, getting his braking done, then letting it roll through the center. I'm very impressed with Johannes. I mean, he's always been a good GT driver, but he has never driven a prototype car until he stepped in and, and you look at it and look what he's done in a very short time. Coming to grips with, pardon the pun, the aerodynamics and the braking capability of a prototype is a pretty big feat, especially for a guy coming from GT. And he's, he's adapted to it so well. I've been very impressed with him over the last year. 10 car on pit road, Ricky Taylor coming in. They've had a good run up towards the front and it seems like ever since Jordan Taylor had to take evasive action there on the back straightaway, Maybe they've lost a lit just a little bit. Taylor out. Max Angelelli looks like he'll be climbing in. God, didn't Ricky leap out of that? I don't even know if it had stopped by the time I saw him fly out. That was, I mean, I mean that figuratively. I mean, he obviously did. Yeah. But he, he, I mean, that is a fantastic driver exit, and, and Max was ready to go. Let's watch, see if they finish in the, get the door closed before the tires are done. So. Yeah, that was and pretty slick. Go. Yeah, that was good. That was actually an, uh, a textbook stop for yeah. a, DP, uh, a DP car with the regulations we have these days. Now we're seeing some oh, problem for the 19, for the GTD Porsches from Milner Motorsports. Quick off and on. We've seen that several times today down at the hairpin. There's a look at the 10, Angelelli now on track. That was funny, when we were at Daytona and we were trying to figure out who was gonna be in the cars at the end and we were thinking, it, we were assuming it was gonna be Jordan Taylor in the end and then when they started lining up to get Angelelli and we asked him, it, we were all kinda, I was shaking my heads and said, are they gonna live to regret that? As you recall, they lost by a second and a half. And as soon as I saw Wayne Taylor, he ran over to me and he said, we wanted Jordan in the car and they went to Jordan and Jordan said, uh, I, I don't know if I'm up to that. Um, and it's just the maturation of, uh, of Jordan Taylor. And then he said he didn't, so that's why they put Max in. And, and now I think they all realize that, that Jordan should have been in that car at the end. But he's, here's a guy who's looked up to Max Angelelli since he was you know, in 13 years old and doesn't see himself as the go-to guy. Yeah. But yeah. now he is the go-to guy in the team. And in Max's defense, they did have a, a, a shock leaking. So how much that contributed to his inability to mount a challenge against Barbosa, we don't know. We're following Duncan Endy there, who is leading Prototype Challenge. Uh, he is hot on the back of the 88, which is not any competition for him right now, but he certainly doesn't want to get slowed down because not far behind, well, actually, it is a long way, it's 60, about a minute behind, is James Gouet. Oh, oh, problem for Andy Lally and the 44. Slow on the racetrack. But in the right place, Brian. Yep. Um, or, is, is this another okay, was, fuel issue exactly with what the I was GT America? Say. Finds his way into pit lane. Obviously, he'll be communicating with his team. Um, it's very hard as you come in that point because they have nothing to base their analysis on. Really, as they come up, the driver's given them whatever feedback he can. Once again, he's got power. The car is rolling okay. Certainly off the pace down the back straightaway, Chris. Well, Brian, just trying to listen to him on the radio a little bit. Andy Lally saying it sounds like it could be a transmission problem. So the team was all ready to do a pit stop and a driver change. 
But Andy Lally, uh, talking over the radio, it sounded like the car was not downshifting. So the team uh, trying to just go through the, the steps here, driver change, fuel and tires, and then they're gonna take a look at that transmission. Andrew? Yeah, I've got uh, Ricky Taylor. Ricky, you came out of that car like a cork out of a bottle. I've never seen anybody exit a car so quick. Uh, it was a little, I don't normally want to get out of the car, but I'm pretty tired, to be honest. And uh, the track is so slippery and greasy, and parts are coming up, and uh, it's just a handful, and I mean, I feel like it's just so much more extra mental energy just to not make a mistake, and I made a bunch. Um, but it's just a handful out there, which is, I think, uh, why I'm so fatigued right now. Yeah, you're looking a bit as if you've been working hard, Ricky, but at least this race has got a rhythm now. Yeah, it's got a rhythm. At least it's been green for a while. I think we actually wanted a yellow for, for once in the race. Uh, just because of our, our track position, we wanted to get bunched up a little, but... Uh, you know, our guys are the best in the pit. I think if we get a yellow, we'll be in good shape. Very good to say that the, look, the perspiration is uh, absolutely dripping off him. Look, you can bottle that and make some money out of it. <laughs> That's just what you want is an old British man <laughs> touching your sweat. That doesn't... <laughs> that's disturbing. Uh, 44 is up on the jack center. It will come down, as I said that. Let's see if it is indeed a transmission. They well, won't really know. Oh, look, he's pulling away very slowly, but... Well, they're going to have to take it out. They're going to have to take if, it out and check. See if they can analyze it a little bit. Andy Lally just climbed out of the car. Maybe he can give us a little uh, better idea of what's going on in the 44. That's right, Brian. Andy checking in with the team down here. Andy, I heard you coming in on the radio saying it was a chance transmission issue or the car just wasn't downshifting. The, com the shifter for the um, paddle shift went on us. We had, the, we had the same issue in Daytona. They just fixed it in like 90 seconds. That's a pretty badass crew we got there for Magnus. And uh, they've done an amazing job. It's like some of courses strong we just got hit with a little bad luck i don't know how far that dropped us down the order yet so so what was the transmission issue and what did they fix it was the compressor the air compressor for the paddle shift uh it's a similar issue that we've had in the past unfortunately and they did an awesome job at daytona and tucker merton just got on it to do the same exact thing again so i don't know we're past halfway hopefully it lasts another six hours or so so Marco Seafried has uh, climbed aboard the 44, and hopefully you heard him say that that compressor issue has been fixed, and it's important to have that compressor. That's what actually actuates. There's no longer that mechanical linkage back to the gearbox anymore. Take a look at this. You have some contact down on the racetrack. That's 912 of Michael Christensen into the 49 of Roberti down at the hairpin. It was a little late getting I'll in there. I'll tell you what, it was way late. You know? This could be bad news for the 912 yeah, you, you, because you, you, the standard penalty is basically a lap penalty. Yeah, you, I mean, you go back to patience and all of that and I guess I look at it and I'm like how much are you going to how much are you going to lose by just being patient and waiting for that corner? It's not what the 912 wanted to see, Andrew. No, I just see them be getting ready, preparing behind the pit, a new nose section, which I think they're going to bolt onto the car when it comes in. So, uh, I mean, Porsche are obviously very much in the fight here against the Corvette. I think they're going to have a, a German uh, battle against the Corvette right to the finish here. And I'm sure that Christensen was told, go, 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 we got to close the distance, we got to close down on these guys, but you're not going to close the distance if you make a mistake and bring about a penalty on yourself and you got to come in for avoidable contact. Easy to say sitting up here. Oh, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But also, I but true, it. but true. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I'm sure it's under review. And it's very easy. Uh, it's very easy to make what I call a lazy pass down into there. It suddenly, the, it looks like the Ferrari checked up more than he thought it had. And he wasn't braking. So, but and, the Ferrari by then has gone, hold on, it's like 100 feet behind me. Porsche yeah. is never going to go by. So is he braking early because he's letting me in? Well, oh, oh, oh no. Nope. <laughs> exactly. So. It's all action right here as we are on board the EcoBoost Daytona prototype. And I, I think 
that this is what makes sports car racing so great. You know, we talked about the traffic that was here today, but you see the class on class, and you got to work your way through. You got to fight the racetrack. You got to fight the competitors that are out there, just like we see the five and the 01 going at it right now. Fittipaldi in front of Scott Pruitt. You got to fight the conditions. You got to do all that. You got to endure, and that's what that's the magic of sports car racing. Look at, and you saw out of the windshield, the, the two areas where sun will be an issue is heading down into the hairpin and then also where that, that bad incident happened coming onto the back straightaway is where the sun will be hitting the windscreen a little bit harder later on. But look at Scott Pruitt, 52 years old, and uh, this car is really coming into its own, uh, starting to apply pressure to the Fittipaldi car. Uh, it, it's go time. They're 22 and 23 seconds off of Van Overbeck. But Scott Pruitt uh, heading towards the front. Great thing is we've had over 90 minutes of green flag running. That's why I'm having last, so much fun right last, now. After the last full course caution. I know and it, the guys talk about getting in a rhythm, and it's it makes the racing great. It, it, I mean, that's what you want to see. We've had way, way too much yellow, over three and a half hours worth, and things are settling down a little bit. I think Pagano is the one who said it. Well, we've had a lot of cars drop out. Maybe that's helped a little bit. Oh, see the oh, sun. Oh, 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 that's very close on the mid to exit of turn 17 there, the bumps. It doesn't take much for your car to step out another foot when you're that close and a little bit of contact, but there was none. Right now, Pruitt is, of course, evaluating the traffic. He's, he's probably got the bird's eye seat watching this little battle in front, but... Well, he is the battle in front, but uh, watching the cars. Of course, that did give uh, Fittipaldi a chance to pull out a little bit there, Tommy, which I think Christian may make the most of right now. Well, you got to feel like Pruitt's got to be frustrated. He wants to get past the 31 and get back into the fight. Yeah, that's the nature of it. It's, it's a little bit like uh, anyone that's into fishing. You spend all this time reeling and reeling and reeling, and then the fish goes on a run and takes a couple hundred yards of line out, and you just got to go back to work um, and, and do that. But uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's the nature of it, and Scott Pruitt's been through this enough time, you get frustrated, but you, you almost have to check your emotions at the door and just be a computer and just head down and just one corner at a time but it, do what you have to do. There's a yin and the yang, and of course you lose if you get yin against you only. You need the you need the yang too, because Scott's right back off on his, was for second, right back off on his tail there, so. When did you first run this race? Uh, 1985. All right, did you, did you run a pace? Uh, back then, we, we actually had a problem in the first hour. It's been 50 minutes down, and, uh, and I was 18 years old, and I just started to put my head down, and we were laps and laps down, and then all of a sudden, and we weren't even the fastest car either, but then all of a sudden, all the favorites started dropping away, and, and we were catching uh, Bill Oberlin's dad by like 25 seconds a lap for the last three hours, but he had like 10 laps on us, and uh, we came up a few laps short. I saw him the other night, and I was going to send a drink over to congratulate him on 29 years since that. That big win from from Auburn. and I've, I've I've never won this race still. Well, I watched Ricky Taylor in that interview, sweating like crazy. I mean, we we don't run paces anymore. I know we said it at the Rolex no, Twenty Four. No. It, it is a sprint, and there was a time when I think you had to come here and say, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna run for ten hours at a certain pace, and then we're gonna race for two. That's long gone, and you could tell it by the interviews you've seen with the drivers get out of the co those cars. When the cars weren't as reliable, you literally. If you ran a flawless race and had no problems, you won by five laps. It was, you know, and now uh, there's there's ten guys on the lead lap and a shootout at the end. So uh, just a different different era. I heard some screeching ah, tires there, but not followed by another noise. So it might be <laughs> oy, a little bit sporty. There we go. Must have been the noise. Must have been. And the prototype challenge cars. That's the JDC Miller Motorsports entry. Brand new team run in the Star Mazda series before, but brand new team, and uh, this is their debut, and really is kind of what that prototype challenge category is about, to bring teams and drivers along. Pretty sure that's the same car that spun in front of the Porsche early on, and you see that yep. damage right yep. there in the exact same spot. So back underway, no damage there, and it's... Nice, safe re-entry, which is something we're pleased about after some of the problems that we've seen earlier today. Chris Miller behind the wheel. On board the 60 from Mike Shank Racing. Negre behind the wheel right now. And they were so quick early on. John Pugh had a problem, had a spin, but trying to work their way back up. And you talk about a team that never quits. Mike Shank Racing is certainly that. They had gearbox issues at the Rolex 24. 
and spent a lot of time in the garage, but they said we were not about to not finish this race for the sponsors on our car for Ford, who has done such a good job in supporting us in this new power plant. There was no way that that Ford EcoBoost was not going to see the checkered flag if we had anything to do with it. And they got it back out there and they got it to the finish. And, the, and actually what I just witnessed on the time and scoring a minute ago was uh, Oz is actually running exactly the same lap times as Van Overbeek at the front. And that is why track position at this point of the race is going to start to play a really important role. Yeah, there's four hours, just a fraction over left to go. But y you can run as fast as the leader, but you've got to be near him if you want to be on the podium or win this one. So uh, if this race keeps evolving like it is, um, pace is not just going to be enough. You really need to, be, uh, need to have track position. Well, and just over five minutes to go before we start awarding points. You were talking about it a little bit earlier for the Tequila Patron North America Endurance Cup. Four hours, eight hours, and 12 hours points will be awarded. So it's just about that time. And if you don't think that these teams think about that, that is not true at all. I know that there were many teams, including Ganassi Racing, who played their strategy at the Rolex 24 to make sure that they could get points, and why would they not? It's $100,000 to the winning team at the end of the year in prototype and in GTLM, and $50,000 to the winning team in both GTD and prototype challenge at the end of the year. So $300,000 on the line. These guys are gonna do what they can to get points. Here's an idea of what it looks like going into 17 and going into the hairpin. It's only gonna get worse over the next hour or so. Yeah, and uh, even with a clean windshield, it's it's not great. And uh, so if you've got oil, got a pitted windshield or out of tear offs, anything like that, it, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's from difficult to impossible to see. Scott Sharp there in the green, number one, trying to close down on Scott Pruitt in front of him. And this is where that whole open top, closed top thing could come into play. If you get close to a guy, He's got that dirty windshield. You're in an open top car and you get into one of those corners. You may be able to make a move on him because of the visibility or the lack thereof. When well, Pruitt's been coming forward, he got around Sharp, but Sharp finally got around uh, Alex Brundle. And so uh, those running fourth and fifth, Pruitt fourth, Sharp fifth, Brundle a couple seconds back in, uh, in sixth and are running a pace at least on the recent laps quicker than the leader. It's like one of the fastest cars in class right now is the 02 of Sage Karam sitting in second place at least the last time by at a 56-1. Full I, second faster than Johannes Van Overbeck. Yeah, and uh, it was very interesting. I spent some time with Sage in Fort Lauderdale this week, and uh, we were staying at a friend's house. And you know what? First of all, <laughs> he's strong as an ox. Well, I was going to right? say. Strong, strong as like, he, he said, do you want to go for a run? And I said, no, it's, it's amazing. I've got a cold. <laughs> but I, I do want to say that I met Sage's dad uh, this morning, and he actually looks younger than us. It's a little annoying. <laughs> You saw the tail end, the 31 looping around uh, in the hairpin. Oof. He handled that right. Yes. The half, half spin. And uh, I, I was actually down in the pits after I, we got up there last time, and I was with Tony Kanan, and, I, and we, he had just watched Karin, uh, Sage really going on that restart. He said, that boy ain't afraid. No, he's... Uh, well, and if he doesn't make it a race car driver, he could be a linebacker, I think. Well, no, he I does mean, wrestle. Yeah. He does wrestling. Uh, the other night in a Brazilian restaurant, we met one of the top Brazilian UFC fighters, and uh, Sage said he fancies a little bit of that. Well, Sebring, Sage, is as close as you're going to get <laughs> for the go. moment, and I think your family would probably prefer you did this. Believe me, I think this is safer. <laughs> you saw Bohr said with the spin and the 31 down there at the hairpin, got it back underway. That's how you re-enter. And there's a look at Sage in the 0-2, working his way past the 63. Down the front straightaway, Oliver Gavin, number four Corvette, and Sage Karam coming up behind. Johannes Van Overbeck still holding on to a lead, 17, almost 17 and a half seconds in hand. So they've run a good pace, a steady pace, and he's got a nice lead right now, but we still have a long, long way to go. Zero one up into fourth, but in the middle of a lot of traffic, and Scott Sharp putting big time pressure on Pruitt right now, Chris. Yeah, Scott Pruitt trying to work his way through that traffic there. And a minute ago, you guys were talking about the sun getting a little bit low in the sky. I was talking to Michael Gara, crew chief on the 01. 
and asked him about the racetrack, and he said, right now, Scott is pretty much telling him the track is changing lap to lap. He said the car continues to get a little bit looser and a little bit looser as the temperature's starting to cool down, the track is starting to cool down. And I asked him if they were gonna start chasing the car with setup. He said, you know, we wanna kinda see where this thing's gonna go, but we're gonna make some changes. We're gonna put Mamo in after Scott on this run, and then it's gonna be kind of a flip of a coin. Do we put Scott Pruitt back in, or do we go with Marino Franchitti to finish this race? Because he said the other night, during night practice, Marino Franchitti was just on fire in the dark. It's interesting that Scott Pruitt saying the car is loose, because he likes a looser car than Memo certainly does, and he's always run very little downforce. So if Scott Pruitt's saying it's loose, it's loose right now. And, I, and Mike Hull said, uh, when I was down there talking to Kanan, he said they set it up that way on purpose, figuring that the track would come to them. As uh, And we heard Pat Geno and uh, Dial say, as the track rubbers in, it's getting better and better and faster. They were uh, banking on the car, the balance shifting a little bit more towards understeer, but that last report doesn't sound like it's happening fast enough for Scott. Oh, one of the best battles on the racetrack is right there between the two GT cars. Those are two GTD entries. Jeff Siegel in the black Ferrari, the 555, and Dane Cameron in that battered BMW from Turner Motorsports has closed the gap and is now right on the rear wing of Jeff Siegel. And Dane Cameron, another one of those young guns who is just absolutely spectacular. Definitely making a name for himself. Remember the pole last year in the uh, the Salins car in Daytona prototype, now getting in this car and just uh, just charges. So it's it's exciting time. Lots of uh, the familiar names we know and a lot of these new ones you've never heard of. The search for these silver drivers that uh, they're starting to scour the young guys that aren't on the registers yet. So if you can find a, uh, literally it's like mining for gold. You find a silver before they turn gold. And here comes Cameron down the inside. Yeah. Siegel leaves him room. It was a gold medal move right there. So now Dane Cameron takes over the lead in GTD. But that was smart driving by Siegel. Yep. He, he, there was no point in defending Cameron was all over his back and now he can control it. He can just sit a second, half a second behind and, and actually conserve a little bit more. But right now, the number four of Oliver Gavin Corvette is about to go up and spoil the party up in front of him. But I think he'll do so rather expeditiously. So he's Jeep. built himself a nice lead. Uh, Ollie has uh, actually it was over. Uh, he had 20 some seconds over Briscoe. Now Christensen and I 12 is in second, but uh, almost a 30 second lead for it. So he can he can afford to be patient. Well, and Van Overbeck's lead has increased a little bit over Sage Karam. He's pulled out two seconds, and you think that that's probably I would think a lot of traffic. It, it's going to ebb and flow. You could probably lose two to three, maybe even four seconds a lap here if you get caught in. Uh, one of those five car gaggles in the in the wrong place on the racetrack. Look at the sun is going down, Brian. And if you look down the straight there, for those of you who don't know what this is like, it's uh, an exciting time because I think as the sun goes down, there's a sense of anticipation on what the night will hold, but it also brings its own very peculiar demands. Corvette heads to pit road. He's going to take a break for a pit stop. Ali Gavin is in, and so we'll take a quick break as well from the 60-second running of the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. Extreme Speed Motorsports having a great run here today. Johannes Van Overbeck leads overall from Sebring. We'll be right back. Three hours, 56 minutes to go from Sebring, Florida, and the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring. 356, that means at the eight-hour mark just a few minutes ago, points were handed out for the Tequila Patron North American Endurance Cup at four, eight, and 12 hours, as you said earlier, Tommy, that gets handed out. And we talked about that a little bit. Johannes Van Overbeck in front in prototype, Ollie Gavin in GTLM, James Gouet in prototype challenge, Dane Cameron leading right now in GTD. Patron shots in the booth, as is the new tradition. Hopefully you at home following along as well. Where are those? You didn't get yours during the break. Talk, That's where do you think I, I went? Get my just cheap I shots. Know, I know <laughs> Justin, they had just cheap shots. Didn't you hear that? There it is. Well, that's the end of your contract with this network there, Tommy. Um. <laughs> well, Justin's the one who left the booth during the break. He probably went out there and actually had some. But There's worth it. Worth it. Here's a look at the 42. Alex Brundle behind the wheel being shown fifth. And there's the 01. Scott Pruitt. And that car's run strong all day. It's run right there around the top five. They just don't seem to be able to match the pace of the team car, the 02. 
Talk about pace. The Corvettes have had pace all day long. Let's check down the end Corvette camp. Yeah, I'm Ollie Gavin, just climbed out of the car, looking fresh as a daisy. Lot there's no piece of sweat on this boy because he is super fit. Well, actually, it's also part of the, uh, the Corvette racing uh, AC system that we run. It's fantastic. And uh, the C7R is running extremely well at the moment. And I have to say a big thanks also to Michelin Tires. Our, our partner there is doing a phenomenal job. The only cars that seem to be able to outbreak us in the whole field are the P2 cars, you know. So it seems like uh, we've got some good performance there from the tyre, but it's uh, there's some, some very creative driving out there from, from uh, some drivers. And there was one, one particular DP car I got caught behind for quite some laps, but, you know, it's, it's going it's going well. And, you know, still plenty of racing to be done here. And, you know, you just never really know. It only takes one guy just to drive in the side of the car or just miss you or and uh, you, you can just be taken out like so many of the incidents today. So, you know, it's, I suppose it's what happens when you get so many cars on the grid, you know, with, uh, with this sort of feel, but it is, it's certainly a very entertaining and uh, non-stop Sebring 12 hours. Now, are you done or will you go back for the uh, final sin? Oh, no, I'll be getting back in, I believe. So I need to go and talk to my engineer, Chuck, but I think I'm going to be going back in. So Tommy's in there now. I think Robert will go back in, and then I'll get back in. I'm, I'm just not entirely sure, but I just want to say big thanks to everybody at Mobile One and also, of course, at Chevrolet and Corvette for just giving us such a wonderful car. What a pro. Thanks very much, Charlie. You now, I talked to a couple of the drivers last year on hot days, on hot race weekends, and they said, I know we just got out, but I'd like to get back in the car because it's actually cooler in the car than it is out here on the pit box. It just shows you how times change. We talked about how the cars have gotten way more reliable and the pace has changed, but the philosophy, it used to be if you wanted the car cooler, you were a wimp, and now it's just, they've realized most teams, and especially Corvette, have realized it's a real competitive advantage to have your guys comfortable, cool, et cetera. Right now, Oswaldo Negre in the 60, putting pressure on Max Angelelli in the 10, but. They've got to kind of look in their mirrors because they're in danger of going down a lap. Right behind them is the two of Johannes Van Overbeck. And think about it, Brian. That is strategy, track position. This has been clean running for over 90 minutes. It's, a, it's, it's 100 minutes right now. The O2 pulls into pit lane. Karam pulled in. Uh, Sage Karam pulls in. Chris is down there to cover this stop. Yeah, another just hot in lap, watching him come around turn 17 here, getting everything he can out of this car. Talking to Mike Hall on the radio, he still seems to be feeling that his car a little bit understeering. Mike Hall telling him to really work the bars. Also, Mike saying, hey, we're going to try a little bit of an air pressure change on this next run. So where the 01 guys are saying they might let the racetrack kind of come to them, the 02 deciding to make some changes and try and chase this racetrack. So important, you saw the crews blowing out those radiators. So important not only for cooling, you want that good airflow up and through the radiators because it comes up and through and then runs down the side of the car. And down the left side is where the air intake is for the turbo system. So you got to make sure you got a good airflow down the side of that car to produce the horsepower that you need. Johannes Van Overbeck really putting pressure on Oswaldo Negre in the 60, just in front of Negre, the 10, Max Angelelli. Boys do not want to go down a lap. Outstanding run by the Patron number two. I mean, from both Ryan Dial and then Van Overbeek. These guys have driven this car so well. Uh, to be able to be about to take laps off people when you've been clean running for, for on the way for two hours, that shows you've been doing something right. And uh, I wonder, oh, sorry, Tommy, uh, but I wonder if, if if it's the nature of the track right now, as it's deteriorate, maybe it's just rubbered in, which suits the P2 cars, uh, the traffic, their ability through traffic. Tommy, you said it right at the top of the show. I think that's maybe what's giving them that competitive edge. Well, it's 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 probably playing to their strengths. The the DPs aren't getting any quicker on the straightaway. If the track's rubbering in, they're getting a little quicker under braking, a little bit mid corner. So maybe balance shifting a little bit in favor of. Uh, the P2, and that makes it easy. That was not good. No one wants to try to figure out how to get around Max Angelelli, and uh, thanks to that little dust up, he didn't have to worry about it. I think Negre got just a little bit of lockup deep, deep in the braking zone, and the car went straight for just an instant. Van Overbeck said, Thank you very much. You've picked up a position, but guess what? You're both a lap down now. 
Yeah, and I don't think they, either of them, if they've been for position on the last lap, they may have pulled onto the racing line a bit faster, but of course they appreciated their team will have communicated that you're being lapped here. Don't defend it. You saw how much curve Van Overbeck used on the exit. That corner 13 is a really quick corner, and but there's a lot of crown to the road. So basically you turn in just carrying big speed, especially in that car, and then you, you really are late back to the throttle. You let the momentum take you all the way out over the crown, use all of that exit road, and uh, it's really about carrying mid-corner speed, not how early you can get back to the throttle. You saw the view that Oswaldo Negre has as it came out of 16 and looking down that long back straightaway into the sun, which is continuing to sink lower and lower on the horizon. That means the sun is getting brighter and brighter oh, and a problem. No. no, that was our leader oh. hooked up with the 48, the GTD entry, Bryce Miller behind the wheel of the Audi. That is not what needed. we need to see in a second, a replay of what happened there, but he got pinned behind the Audi there. See how much damage. Oh, oh, extensive damage to not only the side, the bodywork, but also it looks like the under tray. So Fittipaldi just went by to take over the lead in prototype. Oh. And the Audi not having done it once enough has just did it again, insult to injury as they hit the pit lane. Oh my goodness, we'll be interested to see what our colleagues in the pit lane will say about the damage on the side there, whether it's contained to the side skirt. See exactly what happens if we can. We talked about the track getting narrow there. I'm wondering if that is what happened. Cleanly down the inside, the Corvette is behind the Audi and uh, the Audi just pulls all the way across onto the racing line in a completely unnecessary manner because he can run a wide I, I'm not sure that he can see him though. There was another car yeah. there in the middle and I don't think Bryce Miller knew that Van Overbeck was two lanes over on the yeah. inside. He can't see. He can't he see. Can't, he can't see. He doesn't see the Audi, I don't think. No, I think he uh, saw the yeah. I think he saw the Audi. He just the Audi's doing his own and Bryce, very experienced guy. I, I let's look at the view from the Corvette here. Yeah. Uh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Wow, that, that puts it in perspective how fast that happened and the closing speed there. That's like trying to throw a dart onto a moving gazelle. That was really uh, unfortunate. Chris is standing there right now as the car goes back out. Chris? Yeah, the team really took their time looking at the suspension fore and aft on the left side. Everything looked good there, but the bodywork a bit askew on the left-hand side. They were going to throw some bare bond on, but after the the, the crew took a look at the uh, uh, that side of the car, they felt, you know what, let's get them back on the racetrack. It looks like it's in good enough shape. I'm trying to determine what that, it looks like bodywork that's just flapping up and down. Yeah, Isn't there a but strut that's not going to stay across. there. There's well, a that's, strut that goes yeah. across from the yeah. wheel arch there onto the bodywork, and that is that's probably the biggest. Uh, you can see it right there. That is probably the the biggest uh, problem. It's there for a reason. At high speed, it's yeah. there to support the wheel arch. It's there to channel air over the rest of the car. We've not seen the end of the damage to the two. I feel yeah. uh, the way the car slewed there. He might have a rear toe issue. Also. They didn't deserve that, you know. They'd run incredibly crisply for the past two hours. So disappointing. And we were just talking about the sun, how difficult it was to see. You saw Van Overbeck with his hand up in the air trying to shield his eyes a little bit. Miller way wide and then makes the move uh, across. Yeah. And they just come together. I, I, Van Overbeck may have seen him at the end. Bryce Miller had no idea that car was there. Yeah, brilliant work by our cameraman out there to capture this because they're also dealing with the sun. Look, look. His hand is up. He was almost past him. Yeah. He and this is probably the most exciting shot. You see him angling it. And that's right where I was talking about where that wall sticks out and it gets super narrow because everybody turns in for the last bit of braking. Now you see that support, and like I said, not only is it a support, but it also d helps direct air over the necessary components and aerodynamic bits in the back of the car. How you move air over the front of the car has a big effect on how it moves down the side and over the rear wing. For Extreme Speed Motorsports, what was a great run has potentially turned to heartbreak as Christian Fittipaldi goes to the point he now leads from here at Sebring. Tommy Milner leading in GTLM. There's a look at all four class leaders.
We'll be back to more from Sebring.